Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled Parents you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that if this video gets 1000 likes, she won't try to speak to anyone's manager for an entire week. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And become an official member of the ReArmy today, and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video. R slash Entitled Parents. Lady returns 150 pieces of fried chicken. So, a few years back, I worked for a large retail slash grocery company. And like most grocery stores, we have a deli section. I was working the returns desk, which I was still fairly new at, and a customer rolls up with a cart that had two cardboard boxes full of half-eaten fried chicken. I don't think I've ever seen that much fried chicken before. Me. Hello, how can I help you? Customer. I would like to return this fried chicken. Me. What's wrong with it? Customer. I ordered this for a family reunion this past weekend. I took it home to my family, and when we got to eating it, it was all burnt and nasty. We weren't satisfied, and I'd like my money back. I'd like to note that she's still wearing her family reunion shirt. She's quoting our fresh food policy, which is 100% money back guarantee. So I decide to follow through with the return, although in my head I'm thinking why anyone would buy fried chicken from us, ever. Of course it was going to be bad. Our deli food is known for being nasty. Anyway, she hands me her receipt and it says she bought two orders of 75 pieces of chicken, totaling out to about $100. I do the return, give her her money back, and I come around to grab the cart of chicken. It doesn't end there. Later, I'm taking returns slash claims back to their respective sections, bakery to bakery, frozen to frozen, etc. I roll the chicken cart over to the deli, and the two workers greet me, confused. I don't remember who said what, so I'll refer to them both as deli. Deli. What's this? They ask. Me. Claims. A lady came and returned these, said they were burnt and nasty. Deli. And you took it back? Me. Shrugs. Yeah, it's policy. 100% money back guarantee. At this point, they're now visibly angry. I have a mini freak out and start to doubt myself. Is that the policy? Did I do it wrong? I was still new at returns, so it's possible. Me. Was I wrong? They tell me no and sigh. They ask what the customer looked like and I described her to them. They get more angry. Deli. She came in last weekend to pick up that big order of hers. Took us all day to make it. She comes in and doesn't have enough money. Told us she didn't know it would be that much. She told us about her family reunion and how much it meant to her. She started crying. She only had about $80 on her. So we, the deli and bakery workers, decided to chip in and help her pay for the rest. All three of us looked down at the cart and cardboard boxes filled with half-eaten nasty chicken. This is why I have trust issues. Speaking of fried chicken, what's your favorite place to get fried chicken of all time? Please let us know. KFC, don't at me. Entitled Karen pushes me out of my electric cart. So this just happened at my local grocery store and I'm still fuming over it. For reference, I have a hereditary connective tissue disorder HEDS that makes my tendons, ligaments, skin, some veins, and other connective tissue very loose and stretchy. This causes chronic pain, frequent dislocations, hyperextensions, and generally loose joints. I also have a degenerative disc disease that makes my heart race every time I'm standing and can eventually cause me to pass out if I'm standing for too long. I can walk, but I have to use a cane when I do because I can't walk very well for very long. My knees don't like to support my body weight and I can very easily dislocate a knee or a hip if I step ever so slightly wrong or happen to trip over anything. Because of this, I tend to use my wheelchair for longer outings. Thankfully, my local grocery store has those electric carts that customers can ride around in the store, so I don't have to go to the trouble of hauling my wheelchair out of the car and can just use one of those. So I'm in the store, doing some grocery shopping, minding my own business. I wasn't even really paying attention to the people around me because I just wanted to get what I needed and get out. One of these items I needed happened to be on the top shelf, so I got up out of my electric cart to get it off the shelf. The next thing I know, this Karen loses it because those cards are for people who need them, not kids who just want to take them for a joyride. 
I should add here that if you didn't know me or you've never seen me attempt to walk, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with me. Other than the way I walk, I look perfectly healthy to the casual observer. Now, I get this kind of thing all the time when I'm using one of the store's electric carts, so I just rolled my eyes and told her that I do need it and started to move along to get the rest of my shopping done. Surprise, surprise, that wasn't the end of it. The next thing I know, this lady's hands are on my shoulders and she gives me a hefty shove and pushed me so hard I fell out of my cart. Now I'm just sitting there on the floor stunned while this lady yells at me in between generally incoherent ramblings about stupid college kids. Thankfully at this point, my boyfriend came back from grabbing milk. He rounded the corner into the aisle and saw what was going on and from the look on his face, I'm surprised he didn't deck her. The subsequent argument went something like this. Boyfriend, excuse me, what the heck do you think you're doing? Karen, this little brat thinks it's okay to steal carts from disabled folks. Boyfriend, he is disabled, you idiot. Karen, I saw him get up to reach for something. He's obviously faking it. Boyfriend, you thick jerk. You think just because he can stand means he doesn't need a cart? And you think that gives you the right to assault him? What the heck is wrong with you? Boyfriend then proceeds to ask me if I want to call the cops. Lady starts freaking out over the possibility of actual charges, and I guess the commotion was enough that at this point, one of the store's managers decided to get involved. He sees me still on the floor, asks what's going on, and when my boyfriend explained what had happened, also asked me if I wanted to call the authorities. At this point, I had had enough, was pretty shaken up and on the verge of crying, which I don't like to do in public, and just wanted to go home. At the end of all this, the store manager comped my groceries, banned Karen from the store, and told me he would make sure that all the other stores from the chain that were in the area did too. I've had people give me the side eye or go so far as to chide me for using the store's electric carts before, but I have never had anyone put their hands on me until now. It makes me so mad because this lady literally just saw me stand up to reach something and apparently that was reason enough for her to feel the need to physically remove me from the mobility aid I was using. Now, like I said, to the casual observer, I don't look disabled. Unless you saw me walking or saw me dislocate something, you probably wouldn't know there was anything wrong with me. It just makes me so angry because people ought to know that invisible illnesses exist and not all disabilities can be outwardly seen. Also, just because someone can stand up doesn't mean they don't need a wheelchair. It's not like only people who are paralyzed have the right to use one. And even if I was just a stupid college kid taking an electric cart for a spin, that still doesn't give someone the right to push me out of it. If you think I shouldn't be using it, go get a manager or something. Or better yet, mind your own business and finish your own shopping. I shouldn't have to explain my disability to everyone who sees me using a mobility aid. That happens a lot, even when I'm just using my cane. Random strangers will ask me what happened or how I got hurt. My go-to answer slash shutdown for that is now, I was born. And I especially shouldn't have to fear for my physical safety every time I need to go grocery shopping. Anyway, sorry if this was long-winded or ranty. It was infuriating. Entitled Dad Threatens to Call Cops Over a Lunchbox This is my first post on Reddit, and I created my account specifically to post this story here because it's crazy. It takes place at my summer job at a day camp. I was and am a high school student at the time of writing this. I still work there, so I have to be very careful about giving away too much and identifying the business. It was over a year ago too, so some of the finer details might be misremembered. The interaction is mainly between my boss, the head counselor, and the dad. The cast. We've got Entitled Dad. We've got Mike, my boss, the head counselor. We've got Sam, Entitled Dad's kid. I don't want to call him Entitled Kid as I really blame the parenting here and he wasn't bad at all in this story. And we've got the other counselors and I. As I mentioned, I'm mostly an observer here. So it's the end of the day on Friday. Camp normally ends at 3, the counselors leave at 3.15 and Mike will stay with the kids in aftercare until the last kid gets picked up by 6. However, on Fridays, the counselors all stay late to clean up, usually until around 5 or 6. The kids in aftercare just play by themselves or we put on some cartoons. Mike usually plays with them, but as mentioned, Friday is cleanup day. We're all cleaning up and slowly the parents of kids in aftercare are trickling in to pick their kids up. Sam is just hanging out. Now, we had another kid in the camp, Isaac. His parents had already picked him up. He and Sam had the same model lunchbox. We didn't have a problem with this until today. Entitled Dad comes to pick up Sam 
and goes to get his lunchbox from the table. He picks it up, marches to Mike and says, This is not my kid's lunchbox. Mike sighs and says calmly, I'm sorry, we had another kid this week, Isaac, who had the same lunchbox. I guess that's Isaac's lunchbox you're holding. And Title Dad scoffs and says, Obviously. Now get my kid's lunchbox back. And starts to walk out with Isaac's lunchbox. Mike rushes forward saying, Uh, I can call Isaac's parents, but I'm going to need you to leave his lunchbox here. And Title Dad, Um, no. They have my kid's lunchbox. I have theirs. This is my insurance. I get my kid's lunchbox back. I will give it back when they give me my kids. I'll wait for them to come here. Mike is flabbergasted. All the counselors are listening, but pretending not to so we don't get involved. Mike, well, it might be a while to get a hold of Isaac's parents. They only left five minutes ago, so they could still be driving and not pick up the phone. Entitled Dad, well then, I'm not waiting. I'm leaving. You have my address. I give you my permission to give them my address, and then they can come to my house and make the exchange. Mike, I cannot let you leave premises with another kid's property. Why not? You let that family leave with my kid's property. I don't think I've ever seen Mike more confused. Mike, that was an accident. I can't knowingly let you leave with that lunchbox. Entitled Dad, you guys are lucky I'm not calling the cops. Mike, I'm sorry? Your negligence let another family steal my kid's lunchbox. Mike, starting to get a little upset. Sir, mistakes happen. Again, I apologize for this inconvenience, but there was no crime committed here. This goes on for a few minutes. Eventually, Mike pulls a 1000 IQ move. He was studying to get his master's in elementary education. He knows how to handle temper tantrums. All right, sir, I'll see what I can do. In the meantime, would you mind signing Sam out? He hands Entitled Dad a pen and a clipboard with a sign-out sheet. To sign it, Entitled Dad has to set the lunchbox down on the table. Entitled Dad, of course, doesn't notice and falls for it. While he's signing Sam out, Mike quietly takes Isaac's lunchbox and sets it safely behind him. Entitled Dad never notices. Then, Mike checks the contact list and calls Isaac's parents. His end of the conversation goes something like this. Hi, Isaac's mom. This is Mike from the camp. I believe I have Isaac's lunchbox here. Yeah, he and another kid had the same lunchbox, so you probably have his. No worries. When do you think you'll be able to drop it off? Oh, really? Uh-huh. No worries. See you shortly. Bye. He turns and looks at Entitled Dad. In an impressively calm voice, he states, They will be back shortly to pick up Isaac's lunchbox, but they do not have Sam's. Isaac just forgot to grab his. It was so silent you could hear a pin drop. The other counselors and I froze for a second, but managed to keep the facade of, We're just working here, don't mind us. Entitled Dad freezes for a moment, unsure of what to do. I can see the little gears turning in his head. He comes to his epic conclusion. Well then, it must be here. Genius. He starts tearing around the room, looking everywhere from the lunchbox table to the play area to the game shelves to the office where the kids aren't even allowed in. Everywhere. Mind you, we had been cleaning up, and so everything was very neat and tidy. Was. While this is going on, Mike decides a different strategy. While Entitled Dad is dismantling the last hour of cleaning and tidying, Mike crouches down next to Sam. During all this, Sam had been just quietly playing with some toys. He was around six. Mike, hey buddy, do you remember where you put your lunchbox? Sam nods. Mike, where is it? Sam, on the kitchen table. Everything stopped. The other counselors and I couldn't maintain our indifferent facade any longer. We just froze. Half of us staring at Sam, the other half glared at Entitled Dad. You don't talk to Mike or anyone at this camp like that and get away with it. Now, I briefly want to talk about Mike. He's probably one of the most chill, funniest, silliest teachers slash counselors you could find. Absolutely perfect for a job like this. He could entertain the kids for hours, break up arguments, anything. He would put on these funny personas and act out scenes with them. He was also my first career mentor figure that I had and gave me some great advice. If I was older, I'd say he's the type I could grab a beer with. Just so relaxed and a great guy. He deserves all the praise in the world. I wish I could name him, but that would reveal too much. However, when he stood there, there was a look on his face I had never seen before. Gone was the silliness. Gone was the fun. Also gone was the tolerance for this entitled dad. In the most deadly calm voice that practically shouted anything but calm, he said, Sam says his lunchbox is on the kitchen table in your house. 
the lunchbox isn't here. Entitled Dad once again freezes. His face goes white, then red, then blue. Guess he was still feeling some of that 4th of July spirit. He stutters for a bit before turning to Sam. He said, Now look at this. You've made me look stupid. It was at that moment I lost all little remaining respect for this guy. It was also the moment I felt bad for Sam. Throughout the week, Sam had been a less than stellar camper. He threw tantrums, was entitled, didn't follow the rules very well, etc. All frustration I had for him was replaced by pity. He had been raised in a house where his father's mistakes and actions led to him being blamed. He had been raised by a man so entitled he would throw tantrums over a kid's lunchbox. That's why I'm not calling him entitled kid in this story. He deserves much better. Anyways, Mike manages to put a stop to that quickly by just stepping behind them and non-physically urging them towards the door. Entitled Dad doesn't get the memo and turns to Mike. I still had some hope Entitled Dad would apologize. Nope. Entitled Dad decided it was time for small talk. Entitled Dad. So, Mike, you in college? A stunned Mike. Yes. Entitled Dad. What are you studying? Mike. I'm getting my master's in elementary education. Oh, cool. What's that like? Mike. Great. We learn how to deal with childhood behavior all the time, such as exploration of the world, strengthening communication skills, tantrums. He put emphasis on the last part. Entitled Dad finally got the hint and walked out. We all looked at each other like, what the heck just happened? Mike just shook his head, called his boss, the CEO, to tell her what had happened just in case, and then we went back to normal. I later asked him about Entitled Dad, and he said that apparently the family is really wealthy and buys a spot for their kids for every week in the summer. Then they decide whether or not they want to show up that week, not bothering to ask for a refund. Some families. Speaking of camp, have you ever been to a camp? And if so, did you like it? Please let us know. Karen's retreat coming soon. Book your spots now. My grandma tried to ruin my brother's wedding. My brother's wedding was two years ago, but this still upsets me every time it comes to my mind. My grandmother is rather histrionic. If she isn't the center of attention, she will make herself the center of attention. So it was my brother's wedding and I was his best man. I have a tiny car and needed to be at the wedding venue early and my grandma was going to be picked up by my parents later. She wasn't anywhere near ready and I needed to leave, so I assumed all was well at this point. We set everything up at the venue and took photos and got ready for the ceremony. And finally, my parents arrived with my grandma in tow. She was already upset and causing a scene because I had abandoned her when I left for the venue. We managed to calm her down, but I could see my brother was already getting disappointed with the situation. He just wanted everything to go right, and he's too nice to say anything to our grandma. Things went okay for a while, until we were seating her in the chapel, and she wasn't getting to sit with my mom and dad at the very front where the parents of the bride and groom had the place of honor. Once more, she made a big scene until she was moved to the front next to my parents. My brother was red with embarrassment as everyone from both families had pretty much filled into the chapel. Things calmed back down once she had her way. The last straw was at the reception. Everyone was eating and having a good time. I was going around checking on the tables to make sure everything was going well and people were being taken care of. And then I get to my grandma's table. I don't remember exactly what she said, as I kind of lost it at that point, and this was like two years ago, but it was something like, why is this taking so long? If they aren't going to get the reception moving along, I need you to take me home. I replied with something like, I still have to give the best man speech in a while, and you aren't going to be asking mom and dad to take you back. Then she said the words. She said this to me growing up any time I said something about school or something I had learned or disagreed about, and it basically instantly triggers me. Don't you get smart with me, you little jerk. I saw Red, and I said something to get her to come outside the venue. Then I got vicious. I didn't yell because I didn't want to draw attention to the situation, but anyone within line of sight would easily know I was mad. I told her something along the lines of, You need to sit down and shut up. This is my brother's wedding. He still believes you are this amazing person that he wants in his life. But I've seen through to the vile jerk you are for years now. You mistreat my mom and you're trying to do the same to my brother now. Your BS will never fly with me. I know what you are, and if you don't get back in there and pretend that you're having a great time, you will have nothing to do with my life. She got all mad and said, How dare you talk to your elders like that? I handed her the keys to my car and told her she could leave if she absolutely couldn't stand the reception, but if she did, she would never be invited to be a part of anything in my life. 
Not my wedding, not my graduation, not even to see any grandchildren I might have in the future. And you will be lucky if you see me again before you die. Apparently, she either didn't care or thought I was bluffing because she left. I haven't seen her since. My choice. She complains to my mom that I don't talk to her. I specifically sent her what looked like an invitation that told her that she wasn't invited to my wedding. Then she wasn't invited to my graduation. And after learning about the comments she made about me, who's Caucasian, and my Asian wife, and how it's good we haven't had any kids yet because the world doesn't need any more babies like that, I hate her guts. I'd like to say some part of me still loves her, but after everything, I can't even stand the thought of her. If there was any chance I could forgive her for how she tried to ruin my brother's wedding, what she said about me and my wife pretty much solidified my determination that she would never meet her grandkids and that I'm not even sure I would be willing to visit her on her deathbed. I don't know if I overreacted or if I'm a bad person for responding like this, but I watched for 18 years as she mistreated my mom over and over again, and my dad by proxy. She had always doted on me and my brother, but when she acted like that at my brother's wedding, all of that came boiling to the surface and I tore into her. You won't stop calling me unless I agree to set up a meeting with one of your reps? Okay then. In the mid-2000s, I worked for a small printing company. Our commercial work was on large lithographic machines, but we still had office printers and a number of staff who knew a lot about them. I don't think a single one of our office printers had been purchased new or even working. The owner just bought lots of broken office printers for not a lot of money and then Frankenstein them into working ones. We didn't often buy printer paper because we had just cut leftovers from the factory to suitable sizes for our office. Overall, our office printing costs were extremely low despite the fact that we printed tens of thousands of pages a year. I was a general office dog's body. Among my duties was fielding calls for the director. He would never take calls from cold callers and I was allowed to describe myself as whatever job title they wanted to hear to deal with them. An office printing management service had got our number. They were offering a completely managed service where they loaned the machines, supplied the consumables, took care of everything and you just paid per print. Great for some companies, expensive and unnecessary for us. When they first started ringing, I kept telling them, sorry, we aren't interested, please remove us from your list. Or, we're a printing company, we don't need managed printing services, please take us off your list. This must have gone on for months and I was getting annoyed that they wouldn't take us off the call list and started spending more time trying to explain to them why it was pointless and a waste of both our time to keep ringing. I explained the information above but the caller was convinced he could save us money regardless of all that. I guaranteed him he couldn't, as I doubted we paid more than a penny a page. Naturally, he didn't believe me. As far as he was concerned, if I was answering the phone, I was the office junior, no one important answers the phone, who had no idea how much printing actually cost, and just too stubborn and or stupid to put him through to someone that mattered, and if he persisted, eventually he'd get through to the right person who would reward him with a juicy contract. This same conversation was had at least once a week for the next month or so. He's desperate to let me set up a meeting. Besides, he says he can take us off the list once he's set up a meeting with a decision maker. Right, fine, sure, you can book a meeting for your reps, but I guarantee it will be a complete waste of their time. I scheduled them a meeting with the office manager, me, on a Friday afternoon when I'm the only one in the office so I won't be too busy and it'll be a diversion. The reps arrive, I show them into the office, they're clearly thinking we spend a lot on printing because we have so many printers and I gave a rough idea of how much we get through in the office. They give me their enthusiastic spiel about all the advantages, focusing on the costs. They want to sit down with the figures and see what they can save us. Do I know what we spend at the moment? Paraphrased conversation. Me. Not completely sure. Think it's around 100 to 200 pounds a year. Rep. Nah, it'll be a lot more than that with the amount of printing you do. Is that just the paper? Me. No, that's just ink and toner. Rep looks skeptical. Well, there's the paper too. Me. To be honest, we mostly cut down leftover paper from the factory, or sometimes suppliers give us a few cases for free. Rep. Okay, right. So what about the initial costs of the machines? If you average it out over the lifetime of printers, rather than considering it just a capital expenditure, it can take up a significant portion of your printing costs. This photocopier, for example. It's a few years old now, and you're looking at about 12,000 pounds to replace it with a similar spec machine. So with our service, you can avoid that capital expense. Me. The owner buys them broken and repairs them. Most of the printers only cost a few quid, except the photocopier, which I think cost us 700 pounds, 
As even broken, they're expensive, and it took three broken ones to make that one working again. Rep. Right. So when you need to replace it, me. I hazard to guess he'll do exactly the same again. Rep. And the ongoing maintenance costs? Then there's the costs and lost productivity of downtime to consider. He's trailing off at this point. It's clearly part of his rehearsed spiel. But he can also see downtime isn't an issue when we bizarrely have more printers than computers. Rep. There's absolutely no point of us being here, is there? Me. No, I'm afraid not. That was repeatedly explained to the guy who set up the meeting, but he said your company won't stop cold calling until we agree to a meeting. So, here you are. The reps agree it is a complete waste of time, have a bit of a frustrated laugh about the call center, and says it's not the first time they've been sent to completely pointless meetings because the call center folks get their commission based on the quantity, not quality of the meetings they set up. They don't bother giving me their quote, I never heard from that company again. Am I the jerk for possibly costing my son his best friend? My son, who's 10, has been playing Fortnite with his best friend for a couple of years. For about a year and a half of that time, it was just the two of them playing, and in the last six months, more and more of their classmates have started to join in. My kids are with me every other week, and on the weeks they are here, I spend a good amount of time with them, chilling, doing homework, movies, etc. I live with my girlfriend and her three kids, so we spend a lot of time in the boys' very large room. About three months ago, I started noticing my son being upset and found out that he was being kicked from the groups, and at first I was concerned, maybe he was being a little jerk or whatever. About two months back, I was in their room and my son was playing with his friends and I heard him kind of begging and saying don't kick me and then he said, I don't have V-Bucks to get you that skin and then he got kicked. I asked him what was going on and he downplayed it and I let it go. Since that point, I've seen the same thing happen a few more times and I finally got him to open up to me and it turns out he has been being bullied by his friend for a long time into giving slash gifting skins, emotes and other items. I explained to him that I got the V-Bucks for him to get stuff for himself and that I can't afford to be getting his friend stuff. He said he understood and said he would stop. It turns out that his friend has been doing this to all of his friends and he opened up to me that he had given this kid 20 plus items ranging from 1200 to 2000 V-Bucks, 12 to 20 dollars each. So I've spent anywhere from 250 to 400 on this kid that I know of. I had written out a long text to the kid's mom a couple weeks back and for some reason I decided not to send it. Well, Tuesday, yep, you guessed it. I was in the kid's room and I heard, no Billy, I don't have enough V-Bucks to get you that skin. But then I heard, you know what Billy, I've given you more than 20 things and you've given me one. He was of course kicked from the group. That was the last straw for me and I guess for my son. It turns out that the other kids were giving this kid whatever he wanted and that was why my son often was the one who would get kicked. I told him I was going to be sending his friend's mom a text explaining everything and I also had some text messages with Billy saying, if you buy this skin, I will refriend you. He begged me not to send it but I obviously thought it was important enough that the mom needed to know what her kid was doing. She replied back in a very understanding way, apologizing to my son and to me and said she would be talking to her son yesterday after school. So my son didn't want to go to school today because he's worried about how things will go. So am I the jerk or did I do the right thing? Hard to ruin a five year best friend relationship. And yes, I see that this kid wasn't really being a best friend. Oddly, I blame what's going on for bringing this on. For six months, the only place they saw each other was online. And yes, the mother has offered to reimburse us for the V-Bucks. Update. So I went to pick him up from school and he was doing great. He said yes, his friend is mad at him, but that he was still talking to him. Billy has lost his gaming, phone, and internet privileges for 30 days and was made to apologize to my son. I was trying to keep my posting somewhat short, so I didn't explain how much we talked about all of this. We go on nightly walks. I took the time to explain that real friends don't do this type of stuff and my son totally understands that. I haven't heard back yet from the mom, but have no reason to think she won't follow through and pay us back. Thank you to all of you that commented and wow. I've never received awards like this before, thank you to you all. And to people posting that why did I do this or saying I made a bad choice, I will just say that I've had many parents and people reply they have gone through similar stuff and that this post hit home with them. So that's reason enough for me. Thank you again everyone. Am I the jerk for demanding my girlfriend return the $1200 sofa she bought using my operation money? So this happened yesterday and my girlfriend is calling me a jerk for wanting her to return the sofa that she said she bought to make my apartment look nice. I'll start by saying that my 25 male girlfriend 22 female 
moved in with me two months ago into my apartment. I've been saving for a rotator cuff surgery in my left shoulder. I've been experiencing tense pain in my entire shoulder joint, difficulty with movement, and inability to perform tasks at work. Because my arm would feel numb and I can't pick and lift things with it, the total cost is $7,000 and I'm planning on having the operation before the end of this year for a number of reasons. My girlfriend doesn't have a job. She says she's relieved that I own an apartment and that we don't have to pay for rent. And lately she's been talking about my old furniture and wanting it to be replaced, especially the sofa that she calls ugly, even refuses to sit on it, saying it's old and disgusting. Last week, she's been looking at different types of sofas that she said she wanted to buy. She tried to show some pictures and convince me of how nice it would look in our living room. I refused to buy it because it's expensive and I don't have money to buy it. She said that I have $3,500 in my savings and that I could afford the sofa and then continue saving for my operation. She also said that I won't have to pay a lot of money. I get upset when she mentions this and I told her to drop it completely. Yesterday, I got home at 8 p.m. First thing I noticed was my old sofa outside. I walked in to see what was going on and I saw the round arm sofa she showed me last week. I asked her about it and she said she used $1,200 from my savings to buy it and went on about how the sofa made a huge difference in the interior decor and looked nice. I got angry with her. I told her to return it immediately and get my money back. But she yelled at me that she bought the sofa for me, not her, and that she felt embarrassed by that disgusting sofa that I keep holding on to probably because of memories I had with my ex. I told her she needed to return it and yesterday she started crying and called me a jerk because she thought she was doing something nice for my apartment and then left. I called her and she's refusing to come back to have a civil talk with me and said that I wasn't civil when I yelled at her. Edit. The money was at my apartment. I've been keeping the money to pay for my operation at my place because that was easier than having to go to the bank every day. I save whatever I can get and I also have to pay for other things as well. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you keep the sofa or have her return it? Please let us know. She sounds like a lovely young lady. Reminds me of myself. Karen goes to a public pool and gets angry that other people are swimming. Hello, dear readers. I'm back with another Entitled Parent story for you, starring the biggest mega Karen I know, my mother. This happened when I was 11 in 2001. We had moved to a small town in a new state two years prior to this, and my mother was still getting her foothold in a new place. And by this, I mean my mother and her entitledness. Let me explain my mother. She's about five foot tall, broad shouldered, tubby but strong from doing farm work for most of her life, and a resting bee face that would make Dolores Umbridge want to run the other way in fear and discomfort. Needless to say, she did not look good in a swimsuit, much to my embarrassment the first day she came with me to the public swimming pool. When we arrived at the pool, Mom went to the change room while I jumped straight in. I was already in my togs and board shorts when we left from home. A few minutes later, along came Mother Dearest in her two sizes too small one piece with her chub out for the world to see. I'm all for body positivity and loving who you are, but seeing my mother in her too tight onesie waddling towards the pool was a sight that made 11 year old me wish I couldn't swim. And let's just say that she was in no way elegant when entering the pool. Instead of sitting on the edge and sliding in, she went with a full-on jump into the deep end, throwing other swimmers off course in their attempts to get out of the way. And then came her entitlement, as she proceeded to act as if her $5 entry fee gave her full control over the pool and everyone in it. My mother is not a strong swimmer, so her preferred stroke of choice was doggy paddle or awkward breaststroke. This resulted in her kicking or hitting the occasional swimmer in her laps around the pool and getting angry at them for being in her way. She started yelling at the other swimmers, who were mostly kids, that they shouldn't be here and demanding they get out of the pool or get out of her way. By this point, I'd escaped to the other end of the pool, not wanting to be seen with her. Not long after Mother Dearest had gotten into the pool, she was asked to behave herself or get out of the pool. Mom, not understanding how she was the one in the wrong. What? But I have done nothing wrong. Maybe you should teach those stupid kids to swim properly. Of course, this fell on deaf ears and she was told to leave. As we were leaving, with me wanting to die from embarrassment, Mum muttered something about never coming here again. And even though this threat was something she rarely followed through on, thankfully for me, this time she actually meant it. Every time after this, she would drop me off or I would walk there on my own. It boggles my mind how she can be so rude and entitled to think she owns a space just by being there. But out of all the entitled experiences I've had with her throughout my life, 
this was one of the more milder encounters. Speaking of pools, do you like to swim or not? Please let us know. The best part about the pool is you don't have to get out to go to the bathroom. My girlfriend's entitled mother wants to stalk her location and her bank account. First, I'd like to say yesterday was our one year and I'm leaving for basic training November 24th, so I wouldn't be there for her 18th birthday in December. My girlfriend is 17 and I'm 18. My girlfriend's mom loves to stalk all of my girlfriend's transactions and will question every one of the transactions she makes. She also loves to look at where she's at 24-7 and she's the kid that actually listens in the family. Today I found out her mom despises me due to me going into the military and being poor. Today my girlfriend texted me this. My mom told him not to tell me this, but Keegan, brother of my girlfriend, is nice. So basically, when she was at her friend's senior, nickname for the brother, said they were talking bad about me the whole time. My mom said that she doesn't understand why I'm basing my whole life around you and that I do good in school, so she doesn't think I should do online college. She's wanting to do graphic arts when we move into military housing. And he said that she was complaining, saying I never want to drive anywhere like to the store to grab like one thing for them. Like, um, I'm sorry, but one, you like never ask me to do that, and two, I actually will go drive and you just want me to because you are too lazy to do it yourself. I'd like to start off with I live in the poor class and my girlfriend lives in the wealthy class. Today, I also found out my girlfriend's mom wanted to know what I bought her for our anniversary. I know it might not sound bad, but she believes that I should have evened the money out since she spent almost $1,000 on me for our anniversary. I didn't want her to. The only reason why she did this is because recently she found out I have gone in debt three times to make her happy during hard times by bringing her to nice dinner places going on expensive dates, and buying her things she's always dreamed of. So, she bought me a diffuser I've always wanted, a light alarm, and making me a custom Xbox controller. I asked my girlfriend if she wanted anything for the anniversary, and she said only a stuffed penguin, which was $20, nothing else. Her mom believes that I'm not right for her, has made my girlfriend cry millions of times because of our relationship and many, many things. It's to the point where my girlfriend wants to move out, and never have communication with her side of the family ever. A little while ago, I broke down thinking very badly about myself, but it did make me question. I've never been abusive, and I haven't and will never cheat on her. Sorry I had to rant, I'm so mad and furious. Karen is allergic to chocolate and complains after ordering a brownie. Hi there, I used to lurk this sub a few years back, but never posted out of fear of any repercussions in my personal life. I worked in the food industry for eight years, the last four of which I owned a small cafe that specialized in espresso and a range of cakes. However, I sold my business at the end of 2019 and have no intention of returning to the hospitality industry, so I have many a good customer service story up my sleeve. Today, a tale I will never forget. Warning, it's long. In my cafe, I tried to cater to a few different dietary needs. I supported local micro bakers and ordered several fresh batches of cakes throughout the week, including vegan options. The vegan options were a big seller for us, and we became well-known in the local vegan community. Clicking onto this, I occasionally did limited time specials, and one of my first ever attempts was making a vegan salted caramel brownie monster shake. The vegan salted caramel brownies we sold had been a staple in our store. We got multiple batches a week from a lovely local vegan baker, and they always sold out. So, inspired by them, I made a big old salted caramel milkshake with vegan dairy, caramel sauce slash syrup, chocolate fudge sauce, and it was topped with a whole brownie and a mountain of vegan whipped cream. When I advertised them on our social media, I had very clear and professional photos of the said shakes, and even the brownies by themselves, surrounding the milkshake glass as props. They were brownies, made of chocolate. Thus, they were brown and very clearly chocolatey. In fact, you couldn't make out the salted caramel sauce that the baker drizzled on top of them unless you got close. Anyway, the shakes were a huge hit and a lot of people posted about them. End of the day, at about 4pm, we shut up shop like usual. This was early days when we had no staff, just myself and my partner working all day. We used to get up at 2.45am and get there at 4am and work all the way through. We were tired. I had turned off all the lights, cleaned the whole cafe and had dragged the outdoor tables and chairs inside. The cakes that were able to last more than one day had been packed away in containers and sealed. 
my partner went to empty the bins and left the door just a crack open so that he could come back in without also taking out the keys. There was a very clear sign on the door saying closed with our hours below it. Our hours were also very clearly listed on all of our social media platforms and on Google. I was busy cleaning when I heard someone clear their throat. I remember jumping from shock. There was a middle-aged, scruffy-looking couple standing in the doorway, glaring daggers at me. There were tables stacked in front of them that were blocking the fridge, and the guy, in a passive-aggressive tone, says, I can't see the products. How do you expect people to see the products? I was overtired, in shock, and had my customer service hat still on, so I apologized and asked if he'd like to make a last-minute purchase. The woman then cut in and said, I want the milkshake I keep seeing, the salted caramel brownie one. I was dumbfounded. Not only was the milkshake maker entirely cleaned and off, these milkshakes had a lot of components and took a long time to make and were messy to boot. I started to say it was too late and she cut me off saying, we drove an hour to be here. I could tell these jerks were the type to trash businesses online, so I relented and agreed, but said it had to be takeaway due to the cleanup. They complained again and I relented again. I started to make the milkshake and the man starts to snap at me that I haven't asked him what he's having and he'd like to sit down. My partner has returned at this point, is confused and inwardly upset and says he'll take the man's order. The guy then moans that he still can't see the cakes. At this point, I snapped that of course we put the cakes away when we're closed to keep them good. He then stares at me, shocked and repeats, closed? This guy genuinely tried to claim that despite the lights being out, the shop being dark, the tables and chairs literally stacked in front of him, the food packed away, and the closed sign on the door that he somehow hadn't noticed we were closed. I went back to making the milkshake, flabbergasted. I did my best and made a darn beautiful milkshake, despite how awful these people were. My partner dragged out an outdoor table and chair set for them because they also demanded to sit outside instead of inside the stuffy shop. When I finally finished my culinary art, I carry out her milkshake and his cake. I place it in front of her with a smile and say, ta-da, as I'm used to people's faces lighting up and wows when they see this sugar-filled monstrosity. Her face immediately messes up and she snaps. What is this? Me, the salted caramel brownie milkshake you ordered. Her, no, what is that? She gestured specifically at the brownie on top. Me, that's the salted caramel brownie. Her, it's clearly chocolate. Me. Yes, it is a brownie. They are made of chocolate. I am allergic to chocolate. This is ridiculous. Me. Annoyed at this point. Then why did you order a brownie milkshake? Her. You said it was salted caramel brownie. Me. It is. It's a brownie with a salted caramel drizzle. I thought you saw the picture. I did. And I saw the title, which clearly said salted caramel brownie. Me. Yes, it did. I started to walk away. I was done. Then I hear her husband say, This is ridiculous. False advertising. She pitches in and, I know. I can't even have this. I stopped and turned back, about to try and calm them down, and the man looks me dead in the eye and says, Go away. We're talking. I went back inside, into the back office area, and I cried. My partner asked what happened, and I explained. He was as annoyed as I was and kindly cleaned up the whole milkshake area and ingredients for me while I sat in the back and tried to breathe it out. To this day, this memory grates on me. Speaking of salted caramel brownie milkshake, oh man, that sounds so good. You're going to make me one after this, Mr. Reddit, or I'm going to speak to your manager. Sick kid at the self-checkout. Cast. We've got me, we've got the good mom, we've got the sick kid, and the rich man. About 14 years ago now, I was working at my local Walmart, put in charge of watching the self-checkout on a slow day. I will admit that back then I was inexperienced with people and lazy, but my few months there had taught me a lot about how nasty folks can get. Good mom comes rushing to the self-checkout with sick kid in her cart. He does not look well, and I hear him saying as they come up, I don't feel good mom, I want to go home. Good mom clearly understands that her kid has become sicker since they came in and is trying to rush to get him home now. She's trying to soothe him while simultaneously fumbling her groceries and bare essentials like soup and boxes of tissues. I know, sweetie. I'm sorry. Mommy is going as fast as she can. Well, along comes rich man. He has on what has to be the most expensive jacket I have ever seen. Full business. 
gold watch, tie, pricey shoes, perfect haircut, fit, carrying a lot of coffee. Everything about him makes me glad this is self-checkout because my track record with rich folk treating me bad here is almost 100%. He begins checking out directly across from good mom and sick kid, his back facing them. Suddenly, sick kid starts to squirm and look around wildly. Mom, mom, I need the restroom. Good mom looks up from the checkout and sees sick kid is not going to make it through her checkout. She practically flies around the cart, picks him up, and he projectile vomits across the self-checkout all over rich man's expensive jacket. My jaw drops. It can't be real. As I begin to react, I'm also watching rich man. He drops his coffee and is stunned for a moment when something I was not ready for happens. He turns around, quickly removing the jacket, dumps it on the floor, and walks quickly over to good mom and sick kid, kneeling, because they are now on the ground. Good mom, comforting her crying kid with her eyes, practically begging for mercy at this point. Rich man, is he okay? I walk up with towels, already on the radio for cleanup, and hand him one. He uses it to help clean up good mom. Good mom, he might have the stomach flu. I just needed to pick up some things to take care of him. I'm so sorry. Rich man, it's okay. Let's get him cleaned up. Good mom seems to finally really see the man and how he's dressed for the first time and what happened to him. Oh my God, do you work here? Rich man, wiping vomit off her back while I start on the floor. No ma'am, just a dad myself. Hate to see a kid not feeling well. Good mom was so embarrassed that she didn't really speak again other than a meager thank you as we finished cleaning up and rich man helped her finish checking out personally. I helped him put his certainly ruined jacket in a garbage bag to take home and he checked out as well. I asked him if there was anything else I could do for him and rich man politely declined and left the store. I will never forget how that man reacted that day. For all his obvious wealth, he was his last priority at that moment, even as a victim himself. He didn't complain about the mess or that he might get the kid's flu or his ruined jacket, nothing. And he certainly did more to help than me, the actual employee. I took this lesson to heart for all future interactions with people and it has made a tremendous difference as I became a father myself. Thanks for reading. Edit. I posted this in the morning after I started seeing these stories, mostly about terrible folks of course, on YouTube, thinking that not all of these are a negative thing and the world is in a tough enough place as it is right now. I remember this story very well and decided to share. Since I posted from my phone, I came back to correct any mistakes I had made, like typos and grammar. I'm so extremely happy to see this has made a positive impact on so many people. I could not have imagined so many upvotes and views. More than anything, seeing comments about those who have had an emotional reaction to this brings tears to my eyes in the best way possible. It has sincerely made me feel better in these tough times for my kids' future. Thank you all. Oh, Karen, what's wrong? <laughs> that story is so sweet. Am I the jerk for immediately walking out of the restaurant when I saw my husband's family present for our wedding anniversary? This happened last week, and I'm getting scolded for what I did by everyone. Last week was mine, 26 female, and my dear husband, 29 male, wedding anniversary. His mommy started calling asking about our plans for this year's anniversary. We've been married for three years, by the way. My husband told her that we were going to go out and celebrate and have dinner together. She asked if she could host the anniversary at her house instead and invite family members. It was an instant no from me. My husband seemed to be wanting it, but I already made other plans. She had us celebrate with her while we were together on a vacation for two weeks. That was horrific and the worst experience so far. I knew my husband was still talking to her about it, but I just let them. Two days before the anniversary, he asked if we could have a family celebration but still go to the restaurant and have a good time. I felt uncomfortable. All I wanted was for some time together, alone. Plus, I had other plans after dinner, and to have the family come is not logical at this point. I was working that day till 3 p.m. He didn't go to work. He was busy all morning and didn't want to say with what, so I figured he's getting me a present or something. He picked me up at 3 p.m. I remember his mom constantly calling while we were in the car. I got home, took a shower, made sure he checked with the restaurant about reservations for the night, and we left at 7 p.m. Again, his mom was talking to him on the phone in the car. I asked him why she was calling all day, and he changed the subject. We arrived at the restaurant. He walked in before me. I followed him, and after I walked through the door, I saw his mom, dad, sister, and cousin and her kids. I froze for a second. My heart dropped. 
I felt so much rage as he tried to get me to keep walking. His family saw me when I turned around and walked out and back to the car. He followed me and started saying sorry, but I should just go inside with him since it was already done. I yelled at him, literally just losing it, and telling him that he ruined the night I was waiting for and how he turned it into a family dinner to which I said no from the beginning. He begged me to go inside, but I refused. We argued till his mom came trying to convince me to go in. I went home in a taxi after I told them to go back and celebrate. He came home not liking that I left and refused to talk about it. His mom texted me about my behavior and how I ruined it for her son and the whole family and that I should respect her family and stop whining and overreacting like that. Edit to answer some questions. We're in Europe slash this is our third anniversary. The past anniversary was celebrated with his family slash this isn't the first time. I've experienced the same thing on other occasions. Mother-in-law gets more aggressive on Christmas. She keeps stomping on boundaries and dear husband has no problem with that. Number one answer. So much to unpack here. One, he's allowing his mother to be the second spouse in his life. It's not normal for a couple to spend their wedding anniversaries with extended family. I'm from the US, so I recognize that this may be cultural. Frankly, it's weird that his mom wants to push so hard to spend your anniversary with you. Like Freudian level weird. Two, your husband knew you were adamantly against this whole thing. And he not only didn't tell his mom no, he arranged for her and the rest of the family to have dinner that you did not want to have. That's so beyond disrespectful and dismissive of your feelings. 3. Your husband needs to get it through his head that when he married you, you became his primary family. You and any kids you have, if you so choose, are his number one. His mommy is in second place. She's clawing to maintain that top spot and he is letting her. He gave his mother priority on your wedding anniversary. I mean, that's just beyond the pale. All in all, not the jerk. Set those boundaries and every single time he or his mother crosses them, leave. Ignore her texts, block her number, whatever. You need to tell your husband that you will be handling all future couple-related things in-house and his mother is no longer a factor in the plans you two make. Well, who do you agree with? OP or her husband? Please let us know. I dare you to choose your mummy over me, Mr. Reddit! Entitled mom tries to turn in invalid coupons and tries to steal my box of Girl Scout cookies. Backstory. I went to the store that was walking distance to get some basics for breakfast that morning. Eggs and milk and so on. However, I also had some extra money for a box or two of Girl Scout cookies as it was the season. So after I got the basics, you know I went and got myself a good old box of Thin Mints. Enter Entitled Kid and Entitled Mom. Entitled Kid was a skinny lad of about average 7 years old height. Entitled Kid Mommy, I want cookies. Entitled Mom then proceeds to sigh and assures the little jerk that they will get them after they shop. The cashier proceeds to ring me up as soon as Entitled Mom and her kid get in line. The mom is clearly annoyed that it's taking so long. Once I'm done, I foolishly stick around because I have a feeling crap's gonna go down. She proceeds to almost yeet her items at the poor guy while on the phone and the kid is having a seizure and every other minute screaming, cookies, cashier. That'll be entitled mom. I have coupons. Literally anyone in the vicinity turned and looked at her with an annoyed look. Cashier. Oh, okay. That'll be something close to $100. Entitled mom pulls out a wad of cash and a small stack of coupons. She shoves the coupons in the guy's face and pulls out one or two bills from the wad of cash. Cashier then sorted out all the coupons, but then this is where crap hits the fan. Cashier. Um, ma'am, some of these aren't valid. No, no, no. I checked all of these. They're all good. So just hurry up. No, no. Some of these are almost a year overdue. Oh my god. Stop lying and wasting my time and get on with it. Cashier then shows her the dates and she gets all flustered. Before she can rant, Cashier says, Either you pay for it all, pay for what you can, or get out. Entitled Mom huffs and puffs, but then pulls out a $40 bottle of wine and some small items. She starts a mini rant about selfishness and single mothers and whatnot. I didn't stick around in fear of being roped in. I had what I wanted, my groceries, a Reddit story, and about to get some cookies. I try to get out as fast as I can, grab my cookies, and yeet on out of there. I buy my box, but they have caught up. Entitled Kid I want green boxes. Entitled Mom Well, hurry up then. Girl Scout and Girl Scout's mom were both startled by the rude behavior, and the little one was starting to tear up. 
The mother was about to slap the Karen, but kept her composure. Girl Scout's mom. Please leave my daughter alone and be patient, please. She's only about seven. Entitled mom. Scoffs. Whatever. Hurry up. Girl Scout's mom. Master of self-control. Okay, that'll be this much. Entitled mom spluttering. What? That's so expensive. Two things. One, Karen, where do money wad at? And two, it was like $10 plus tax. Girl Scout's mom. Well, that's the price, so please leave if you cannot pay. Entitled mom sniffs. Come on, son. We're going home without your treat because these two jerks can't give a bit of charity to a single mother. Upon hearing that he was being denied his cookies, Entitled Kid started throwing a Category 5 tantrum on the ground, causing Girl Scout to cry, as any reasonable kid would do when being screamed at. Girl Scout's mom hugged her daughter as the little Entitled Kid continued to cry and wail. Entitled Mom did nothing, rather letting her kid cry while giving a dirty look to the Girl Scout and her mother. I decided that it was my time to vamoose before I… nope, too late. Entitled Mom spots me looking and then sees my boxes. Hey, you! Me, internally. Oh no, externally. Who, me? Entitled Mom. Obviously. Can you possibly spare some cookies for my precious angel? Entitled Kid immediately stops wailing and runs up to me with a big old smile filled with cavity crowns. I mean, what could I say to that poor struggling single mother and her sweet kid? So, as any reasonable person would do, I simply reply, no, sorry, and turn to leave. Entitled Kid resumes his tantrum, and Entitled Mom then grabs me on the shoulder. What the heck did you say to me, you little jerk? How dare you say no to me? I am a single mother and an elder, so you have to do what I say. Me. Ma'am, three things. One, I don't have to listen to you. Two, I don't owe you anything. And three, you have about ten seconds to let me go. Oh, what? Or that nice security guard will be forced to restrain you and possibly call the police for harassment. Well, who do you think they're gonna believe? Some bratty kid and a rent-a-cop? Me. Well, what about this fine mother and her daughter? We then see Girl Scout's mother recording the incident and Girl Scout behind her. Entitled Mom starts to realize what deep trouble she's in and attempts to backtrack when Security Guard walks in. Security Guard. Ma'am, is there a problem? Entitled Mom. Yes, this little jerk stole my cookies. And Security Guard. Ma'am, this rent-a-cop already heard everything so I suggest you leave now. Entitled Mom then splutters and tries to defend herself, but Security Guard wasn't having any of that and escorted her off the property, informing her that she was now banned from the store. Before I left, Girl Scout's Mom stopped me. Girl Scout's Mom. Hey, thanks for dealing with that. Well, you know. Me. No problem. I'm sorry you guys had to deal with that. Girl Scout's Mom. Here, why don't you take another box on the house? Girl Scout. Thank you. Speaking of Girl Scout cookies, what's your favorite flavor Girl Scout cookies of all time? Please let us know. You'll never make me choose just one. Am I the jerk for refusing to take the blame for my roommate losing her job? I, 21 female, have been friends with my roommate, 22 female, since kindergarten. Our whole lives she's been bad at borrowing things, not giving a borrowed item back for weeks or months, and sometimes forever. But she's an incredible person otherwise, and I love her. This event may change things though. Her laptop charger stopped working on Saturday and she asked if she could borrow mine. I said yes, as long as she, one, didn't take it out of the house, two, gave it back to me on Tuesday as I had a very important meeting at 9am and would need to plug my laptop in for as it would be hours long, three, gave it back to me on Sunday, the 18th, as I will be going home to my mom's house for the week. She said no problem, she planned on going to buy a new one on Monday anyway and wouldn't need it that long and she began using my charger. I texted her yesterday morning to remind her I needed my charger for my 9 a.m. the next day, today, and because I'd be home from work around 1 a.m., I asked her if she'd leave it on the kitchen table or in my bedroom. I got home around 1.30 a.m. and the charger wasn't anywhere in the house. I checked my laptop to see if I could do the meeting without the charger, but it was at 20%. So I went into her room, unplugged her laptop, and took my charger back. Today around 1 p.m., I heard her wake up. She started freaking out. Apparently, she had lost her phone and was using her laptop as her alarm. She was supposed to open at her job at 6.30 a.m. She asked if she could borrow my phone and called her boss and she left for work. She arrived back home at 3, basically weeping. She had been written up three times before this and because of this, she lost her job. 
She started going off on me about how messed up it was that I took the charger. She thinks I should have reminded her in the evening to leave my charger out or woken her up before taking my charger back to ask if I could have it so she could set up a different alarm or asked me to wake her up. She asked me to call her boss and explain that it was my fault she was late. I refused. I said it was her fault she lost her phone. Her fault she didn't charge her computer that day when I texted her in the morning to remind her I needed my charger back. Her fault she had already been written up three times. She refuses to speak to me now and our mutual friends say one of three things. I should have known better to let her borrow something because I know how she can be. I should have woken her up and asked for it back or at least called her boss to explain. But I just cannot agree with any of them that this is my fault. Is it my fault she lost her job? Am I the jerk? Update. 1. My refusal to call her boss was out of frustration with her and my friends. I was feeling attacked, so I was refusing to help because I felt like they weren't saying my side. Why should I lie for her? It was also extremely out of character. I love lying to authority to make things better. Haha, <laughs> who doesn't? 2. She is not lazy. People who are so ready to judge are a huge bummer. This was her ninth day of working in a row. The majority of those shifts were 9 plus hours, something I didn't mention but didn't feel like it was necessary. If someone sleeps for 12 hours, it's usually because they need it. Usually, people who work shift work have a messed up circadian rhythm. I work until 1 a.m. sometimes and have to be in for 11 a.m. the same morning, then I'll be off for three days, then I'll work different shifts. It changes constantly, same with her. We don't have a sleep schedule. We sleep when we can and both work the rest of the time. 3. She's apologized for blaming me and knows she should have bought a charger yesterday and should have told me she lost her phone but was too embarrassed and thought she'd solve the problem. She didn't think I'd take the charger when I got home but can understand why I did, being afraid she wouldn't give it back in time as she never really does. But she does still think I should have woken her up when I took it. Maybe she's right, I don't know. She knows if I call her boss and say the truth that her boss will just say, well, she should have told you she lost her phone and she should have replaced the charger. 5. She's been at this job for 7 years. She's been in the wedding of a coworker, and we both babysat for her boss when we were in high school, which is why this blew up so much, and why she and all my friends were so quick to blame me. Her job is super important to her, which is why we've decided this. No, I'm not her mother, but we've been best friends for almost 16 years, so it's a little more than just a crappy roommate situation. When I said she's a lovely person otherwise, I meant that. Thanks for the input, it helped with such a quick turnaround. Entitled mom demands I serve her after we close and embarrasses her daughter. So this happened a couple years ago. I was telling a coworker about this today and decided to share. And a little background info. I've worked in retail for over 8 years and have spent 5 of that working in the deli. Now, even after 8 years and multiple different stores, I still love people. I always try and see the best in people and anytime I have bad customers, I try to kill them with kindness. Because of this, I always strive to give the best service possible and even get on my coworkers' nerves because I will take people after closing, unless our slicers are already clean. Anyways, the cast. There's me, Entitled Mom, and the manager. So one Friday night, when I was still working for Walmart, both of my other closers called off. My manager gave me permission to close down at 7 instead of 8 and specifically told me not to take anyone. He was aware of me helping people after closing because I wasn't allowed overtime and needed to finish up. So around 7.45, Entitled mom walks up with her daughter, around my age, and begins to order. Me. Ma'am, I'm really sorry, but I had to close early tonight. I'm very short-staffed and have already cleaned all my slicers. Entitled mom. Oh yeah, we'll see about that. She walks away as her daughter follows and shoots me an I'm sorry look. As soon as they walk away, I started to put my slicers back together because I know what's coming. And sure enough, a few minutes later, Entitled mom comes back with my manager in tow. And of course, he tells me I need to help them. Manager, I know what I said before, but you have to help her. I'm sorry. Now, like I said before, I try to get these kinds of people with kindness. So right away, I try and defuse the situation. Me, ma'am, I'm sorry for denying you service. I really hate telling people no, but I'm just behind. Entitled mom, you don't seem very sorry. You were so rude when I came up here the first time. You shouldn't have told me no. Me. You're right, ma'am. I'm sorry. Her daughter is still looking very uncomfortable and seems to be trying hard to say she's sorry without speaking up. My manager actually stayed and helped, and him and I got to chatting, and I can't remember how, but me being from New York came up. We were in Florida, and suddenly, Entitled Mom chimes in like our first interaction never happened. Entitled Mom. Oh my god, 
You're from New York? Me too. What followed was a generic, forced, friendly conversation as I engaged with her and also tried to pretend like our initial interaction hadn't happened, but I could see her daughter had relaxed a bit and didn't seem so embarrassed anymore. After we finished up and she left, my manager praised me for diffusing the situation and still being friendly. All I could say was, thanks, but forget that dumb jerk, and we shared a laugh at her expense. She became the butt of a lot of jokes up until I left, so at least I got something out of it. Speaking of deli meats, what's your favorite deli meat of all time? Please let us know. Deli ham, bruh. End of discussion. Steal my security deposit and ignore me for a year? Say goodbye to your staff and reputation. So background. Around Thanksgiving 2017, my wife's company offered her a fantastic promotion, which she accepted even though it meant moving across the state by January 1st. The month of December was insanity. List and sell the house. Find a short-term rental which would accept four pets, pack, move, etc. A lot of whiskey magically disappeared, but I got it all done and we moved into our rental house and all was well. We bought our new home and moved and the rental lease officially ended on April 1st. The property manager followed the state laws correctly so far and we were told we'd get the $1,800 owed for our security deposit back by May. Spoiler alert, it never came. I spent the next four months going back and forth with the property manager and hearing, it's coming, we never got your paperwork, blah blah blah. I got sick of this and got two different lawyers involved and sent them official demand letters. I also filed a formal complaint with the State Division of Real Estate against their license. The property manager kept telling the state investigators that they would pay us back, but nothing ever happened. I didn't want to formally sue via our lawyer because he charges $300 an hour and it's all up front. I was hesitant to go to small claims court because it's a $5,000 max in our state and the damages we're legally owed are three times the $1,800 deposit, which puts us over that cap so I'd have to give up on some of the damages we're legally entitled to seek, eat roughly $500 total in fees, and then go through that whole process for the next year, and assuming we won the judgment, then go through the collections process for another year or two. An option, one we'd win, but a big pain in my butt. So this is where the pro-revenge comes in. It was initially petty. Say their website is crappypropertymanager.com. I bought crappypropertymanager.co for $12, and posted all of my screenshots and info about their theft and BS for the world to see. And then I bombed it all over their business Facebook pages as well as the personal pages for the main partners and their Yelp page. I got a kick out of it. They took their pages down. Petty revenge wins, right? My little website caused a bigger boom than I anticipated. Basically, this property manager has two principal agents in charge and a broker. One of the agents is married to the broker. Beneath them, they have, well had, five realtors. I sent my new website to them all, everywhere I could. Turns out, the partner who isn't married to the broker had no idea that the broker and his wife were stealing money from the property management company. The realtors had no idea either. Two of them quit immediately and one reached out to me to let me know why she quit and that she was going to find a new broker. But the other principal of the company was mortified. She asked me to leave her name out of it, take this stuff down, etc. And I just politely but coldly replied that Hey, your business partner slash broker stole my money and I can back everything I'm saying with documents, not my problem. She promised she'd get things resolved and for the first time in 10 months, the broker started answering my emails. We worked out a deal and they're now paying us $200 a month until December, which will cover the amount owed plus the extra for our legal fees. The first check came last week. It actually bounced, but I made them send me a cashier's check and they have to send cashier's checks going forward but we did get our first installment. I've also learned that the state investigation has been turned over to the state's legal department and the broker and his wife will likely lose their license. The state investigators said they had multiple complaints against them, but I was the most thorough and had the most documentation against them. So our complaint was a big reason they had the ammo to push it to the legal team. So all told, my crappy little website ended up costing them 40% of their real estate team, resulted in them removing their business Facebook listings pushed the investigation into their license over to a state legal team, still ongoing, and resulted in them having to finally start paying us not only the $1,800 we're owed, but the legal fees I spent on top of it. Oh, and that bounce check? I made them send me a certified check for $12 to cover the bank fee for that too. Update. From March until October, we received the checks for $200 a month, no problem. They were a few days late sometimes, but they arrived, so I went with it. The initial March check had bounced, but they sent certified after that, so it also wasn't a huge deal. 
Then October hits. They don't send a certified check, but since they had been good all year and we were nearing the end, I deposited it. It shouldn't be a shock that it bounced, so I emailed them to get this fixed. The property manager says, Sorry, I goofed. Since we only owe you $600, I'll send you one check now for $312, plus half the bounce check fee, and the rest in December. I agree. Weeks pass, nothing. So I reach out in early December and finally get a check, but it's only for $200. I was fed up with their games and this BS hitting almost the two-year mark, so I stuck to the deadline and said I expected the remaining $412 by 12.15. The 15th comes and goes, so I email again on the 16th, and what do you know? Radio silence. Totally ignored. So I waited until the 23rd, right before Christmas, and just sent them a short email saying exactly that the website was going back up and I'd resume legal actions since they decided not to honor our new written agreement. The partner who got the repayment process started in the first place had finally had enough and snapped and said she couldn't deal with this over Christmas and that she'd repay me herself to be done with this. I received our final check for $412 today. After two years of this BS, it's finally over and I have all of our security deposit returned plus some to cover my legal fees and certified mail costs. The total fallout on their end, three of their five realtors ended up leaving based on my website. They had to repay me everything they owed me and I didn't let them off the hook, and I just used the state tool to look up their real estate license and the license hearing did not go their way and their license is on probation with 11 complaints filed against it, which will all require repayment and remediation, with the most recent complaint being an internal administrative complaint based on my actions, which will likely result in them losing their license altogether in 2020, although that's just an assumption, but a likely one since the administrative complaint is the most recent and is wholly open. Final Update that's where I figured it would end in late 2019, with 11 open complaints on their license and the state just giving them slaps on the wrist. I figured it was as good as we could expect. Tonight, I got curious and bored and hopped on the state license portal to see what had happened. When we left off in 2019, they had 11 open complaints, 10 of which were from renters and one from the state itself. That was the one which had me curious. The state closed out my case and nine others in June of 2019, which put their license on probation for a year gave them courses to take and some whopping fines, which were basically nothing. I don't know how they messed up, but the state complaint got taken higher and into this year, and as of July of 2020, their license has been completely revoked. Not just the business license for their real estate, but the personal license for the jerks who did me around too. I got my money back and they're out of business partly because of me? I'll take it. In any case, I was already happy with how things ended, but knowing their licenses are gone? Love it. Have you ever had a company try to take advantage of you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Every time I go to the grocery store, to be honest, I have to find my own coverage? Alrighty then. About 10 years ago, I got my first job at a nursing home after coming off of active duty military. The director of nursing, who we'll call Don, was in the reserves, so we hit it off pretty quick. I got my nursing license while in the military, and I had only really cared for young strapping soldiers, not the elderly. But Don and the other nurses taught me the ropes. It was a good place to work. I was able to pick up shifts whenever I needed them. I made some really good friends and the residents and their family were all pretty great with the occasional not so great ones. Now, when I went off active duty, I enlisted in the reserves. I wasn't quite ready to be fully done with my military career. Drill was always the first weekend of the month, always. I still made sure the scheduler had a copy of my drill schedule. After a year, Don deploys. Enter the interim director of nursing who we'll call Satan. I mean, Karen. She had an issue with me since day one. Not sure why, I never missed work. Took care of my patients like they were family. I had never been in trouble. I just was nowhere near her list of favorites. Within the first two months of Karen being there, the scheduler quit. I made sure new scheduler had a copy of my drill schedule. New scheduler was cool. Was able to change us from eight hour shifts to 12s. Made sure the same nurses worked the same halls for continuity of care. Never had an issue with her. After three months, that scheduler quit, along with a few staff. A girl from the front office covered staffing for a few weeks until they were able to fill the position. A nurse transferred from the floor to scheduling. She was a bit scatterbrained, but was good at her job and was not afraid to work the floor when needed. Once again, I made sure she knew when I had drill. She lasted about four months. The girl from the office once again stepped in and eventually got the position full-time. I pointed out my drill schedule to her. It was hanging on a bulletin board where the previous girl had put it, and she said she understood. 
By this point, my patience with Karen was running thin. She found ways to make sure I knew she didn't like me with almost every shift, checking to make sure my med cart was locked five to six times a day. She never checked other med carts. Go into rooms and push the call light to see how long I took to answer. Once again, only on my hall, and always had snarky comments to make about what she decided I was doing wrong that day. Now, I worked that hall three to four days a week, 12 plus hours a day. I had that hall down to a science, and I had the best CNAs in the building. They were rock stars. Karen decided that I could handle it and pulled my CNAs during breakfast for dining room duty. I had to do morning med pass, check blood sugars, do insulin on the diabetic residents, toilet them if needed, pass breakfast trays, and feed a few people on my own. I had 34 residents on my hall, and only about 12 of them went to the dining room. I was not happy to say the least, but I found a routine and was able to knock it out. That made Karen try harder to get to me. Then on a beautiful snowy Thursday at the very end of January, the schedule for the rest of the week, weekend, and following week came out. The coming weekend was the first weekend of the month. And what do I always have on the first weekend of the month? Yup, drill. I was still on the schedule for that weekend. Scheduler was nowhere to be found and not answering her phone. I text the nurse who works my hall on days I'm off to see if she could pick up and I would work for her next weekend. No dice, she was going out of town and couldn't. The scheduler finally texts me and tells me that I never told her that drill was this weekend and had no one to cover my shifts. I told her that I'm willing to trade the weekend with anyone and work their shifts. She texts back that she has no one and that I should have told her about my drill weekend ahead of time. So I went to her office once she got back from wherever she was and as nicely as possible point to the drill schedule hanging on the wall right next to her desk and ask how she couldn't know when it was hanging right next to her. The blood drained from her face and she said she will figure it out. I remind her to tell the other nurses that I will pick up shifts in return if it helps cover it. An hour later, good old Karen comes up to me and lays into me. She tells me I'm irresponsible for not telling the scheduler my drill schedule and that they are not finding coverage for my shifts. I either have to work them or find coverage myself. She asked how she could even be sure I really had drill weekends and wasn't just trying to get out of work, that she should write me up. She would cut me off any time I would open my mouth to speak. Once she said her fill, Karen took off to her office. I'm a pretty laid back person and I'm usually very calm. My blood was boiling. I was able to get my shifts covered pretty easily since we were pretty well staffed. The scheduler hadn't even tried apparently. Well, she tried throwing me under the bus. Drill weekend comes and goes. Monday morning, I bring copies of my DD-214 from the active army, my orders sending me to the reserve unit, about 10 copies of my drill schedule, and printed pic of my drill schedule hanging on the wall next to the scheduler desk. I had already found coverage for the drill weekends I had to work for the next six months and even started on finding coverage for the two-week drill a few months away. After morning med pass, tray pass, feeding, and toileting were finished, I walked into Karen's office, handed her the DD-214 and the orders, told her that there is her proof of my military duty, handed her the pic of the schedule hanging on the wall, told her I should not have to remind them every month, especially when it's hanging next to the scheduler's desk, handed her the 10 drill copies just in case they needed more than one since that didn't seem to be enough. She just sat there, glaring without saying a word until I put the list of weekends I had already found coverage for in front of her. Then she smirked and said maybe this taught me how to be more responsible. I smiled and told her, oh, absolutely it did, since my time in the service obviously didn't teach me anything and that I'm sure my soldiers would appreciate her teaching their platoon sergeant such an important lesson. Then I slammed my two-week notice on her desk and explained to her that what she tried to pull was illegal and that I could have the Department of Justice in there so fast her head would spin. As I walked out of her office, State walked into the building. State audits nursing facilities. They watch everything and go through everything and make life heck for mainly management for a week or two. One of the state auditors ended up being ex-army. She hung out on my hall just chatting every day I worked. Karen would look at me like a deer in headlights when she walked down my hall. I guess she thought I would purposely get them dinged or something. I was good and just enjoyed her nervousness. I trained my replacement the next week. I went on to the local hospital and I'm still there. Karen went back to corporate once Dawn came back from Iraq. She learned what happened and reported her to corporate for that and some other things. Karen was fired. The scheduler was fired a few months after I left. Turns out her mom, who was a unit manager, was doing her job. Am I the jerk for possibly causing a divorce for my wife's best friend's marriage? My wife, 31 female, and Amy, 32 female, are best friends for about the past 15 years. 
About two months ago, Amy gave birth to a boy. Me, 34, male, and my wife have four kids, one who's three, two who are four, and one who's six. So we've been helping Amy and her husband, Jake, who's 29, because we know how hard and stressful the first few months with a newborn can be, specifically because they are first-time parents. My wife planned a girls' night at our house and invited her friends. She does that once a month. When my wife hosts those nights at our place, I usually go out with some of my friends to a nearby bar. Amy and Jake moved to our city around one year ago because Amy wanted to stay close to her parents and she had a better job opportunity in our town. Since they moved here, Jake has no family or friends nearby, except me. So I decided to invite him to come with my other friends to the bar. Jake is very shy and reserved. He doesn't talk a lot, but he's a great guy. When we arrived at the bar, I tried to push Jake a little to interact with the other guys, but his answers were always short and simple, and then I told the rest of the guys that Jake was a first-time father and that his daughter was born two months ago. Finally, a conversation that Jake seemed to engage. The other guys in my friend group are a bit older than me, so most of them are parents, and things were going pretty well until a friend told us that the first time he thought, holy crap, I'm a dad, was when he cut the cord after his wife gave birth. After hearing this, Jake went a bit silent and said that he wasn't present at the delivery room when his wife gave birth. Then he asked us if that was a big deal and if he missed a lot not being there. Well, the consensus on the table was that being able to watch our kids being delivered to the world is one of the most important moments in the life of a father and that yes, he has missed a huge thing and that he lost one of the hugest milestones in a marriage. After that, Jake went a bit quiet and left shortly after. Two days later, Jake asks me if he can stay with me for a few days because he needed a bit of space from Amy. Amy called my wife crying, so she went over there to talk to her for a bit. After that, Jake arrived at our home and that's when he told me that he wanted to be in the delivery room, but with the current restrictions, only one person was allowed and Amy chose her mom. Apparently, he tried to argue with her, but she was adamant and in the end, he was not allowed in the birth room. Jake told Amy what he heard at the bar. They got into a big fight and currently Jake is considering a divorce. Needless to say that Amy is furious at me and my wife is currently giving me the silent treatment. She said that I probably ended their marriage. I feel really bad with the whole thing, especially with a baby in the middle. Am I the jerk? Edit. Jake is a surgical nurse. He already helped deliver other people's babies. I guess that this adds salt to the wound. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. If they're really getting a divorce over something like this, then their marriage was already doomed. Don't worry, I'm getting a discount either way. Edit 1. I'm Australian. Tips aren't a thing where I'm from. So last night I was looking after my section and there were two ladies in probably their mid to late 20s, one with a baby, referenced as choosing beggar from now on, that had just sat down. Unknown to me was the fact that they were occasional regulars. I walk over to their table wondering if they needed any menus and they didn't need any just ordered some fried chicken and chips. This is where it gets juicy. Food came out in about two minutes as there was one already just made in the kitchen and we were still waiting for a steak to be fully cooked. No big deal as it's really easy to fry up some chicken and chips in no time. I take out their food and they are surprised at how fast the food came out. I go back maybe two minutes later max and ask how the food is going. This is the following conversation. Choosing beggar. I think something is wrong with our food. Me. Oh, in what way? Well, I don't think our food is fresh enough because it came out so quick. Me. Oh, I can get that one replaced for you if you'd like. Did you have the food pre-made by KFC or something? Because there's no way it could have come out that quick. Me. I can assure you it is fresh and cooked to order. If you would like, I can replace the food, get you something different, or even bring the manager over for you. Oh, I would like to talk to the manager. Just not yet. Me. I mean, they're literally over there. Points at manager. I'm sure it wouldn't be an issue. No, I will make sure to talk to them later when I pay. Me, it would be easier to talk to them now as no, I want to talk to them later and get myself a discount. Firstly, I was taken aback and didn't even know how to react or what to say. The audacity of this jerk, basically. Anyway, I asked if she wanted anything and she didn't and I walked into the kitchen, explained the situation to the chef and the kitchen had a good laugh and we all talked about it to the manager. Choosing Beggar proceeds to walk to the front desk and my manager is there waiting. She proceeds to argue that the food came out too quickly, that it wasn't fresh and there was no way it couldn't have been KFC. My manager just simply asked, did Domestico ask if you wanted the food replaced, swapped for something else or offer for the manager to come investigate? She said yes, 
Manager said there was nothing he could do as company policy was met and that if there was issues with the food and she didn't want them fixed, no discount could be given. She exploded, paid, and left with the most ticked off face ever. Best part is, she tried to use her baby as an excuse. Am I the jerk for refusing to go on a surprise vacation with my wife's family? You're probably thinking, oh, amazing, a vacation. I wish I could go on one right about now, and you would be right. I would love to go on a vacation, but not this one. I, 30, male, and my wife, 26, female. And if I'm honest, I adore my wife, but I absolutely hate her family. Her mom is a know-it-all who thinks everything is her business. Her sisters are snobs who criticize everything despite being anything but successful themselves. Their kids are spoiled brats. Her dad is just a broken man who seems to have given up decades ago, and the rest of her extended family is pretty much like the rest. Somehow, and in some way, my wife got all the good genes and ended up being an extremely sweet, beautiful, caring, empathetic woman. Well, yesterday, my wife decided to surprise me. She prepared a really romantic meal, wine, candles, the whole shebang for me after I got home from work, and she told me we were going on a three-week-long vacation to a secluded cabin in a great hiking area of my country, given I had to take up my vacation weeks away. I was honestly pretty dang excited. I love hiking. I grew up in a small town with loads of nature and used to hike pretty much daily. I love cabins, and honestly, I really needed the break, as my job has been extremely stressful. Shortly after, she revealed with the biggest smile that it would be a huge family vacation with her mom, her dad, her sisters, their kids, and a cousin and her kids, and honestly, my heart just dropped. Trust me, I do my absolute best to stay on these people when I see them for the sake of my wife and act like the perfect son-in-law. But the idea of spending my only vacation days in a cabin with these absolutely horrible people is just a full-on no for me. I'd rather stay at home doing nothing for three weeks. I've been with them on vacation once, and the entire time it was just them arguing, complaining, and us being forced to take care of her sister's kids half the time. I straight up said that I was not going to do that again, and that she was free to go, but I'm not going. She started crying and seemed extremely upset that I reacted the way I did, despite never hiding how I feel about her family. We ended up arguing a whole bunch, and she ended up leaving to stay with her best friend who lives down the street. Am I being the jerk here? I sure feel bad but I also feel like this is just legitimately messing up the few weeks a year I get off, and I honestly just want to have some peace and quiet. Just to be clear, she wants to leave the day after tomorrow. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Man tries to steal my shopping cart. This happened to me about a month ago. I was running errands and my final stop was to buy some groceries. I had just gotten off of work and was still in my work uniform, which is a black polo with a big staff across the back and my company's logo on the front of the shirt. Now, I hate walking into stores with a staff shirt on. I'm not a fan of strangers knowing where I work or causing confusion for having a staff shirt on when I don't work at a business. For this reason, if I'm in my work shirt, I'll throw on a jacket or a hoodie before I walk in someplace. This is exactly what I'd done just before I entered the grocery store. So my staff shirt for the place that I do work is completely covered by an oversized varsity jacket with studs and a big tiger across the back, and I have ripped black jeans on. The uniform for the grocery store is green branded t-shirts and khaki pants. I look nothing like the staff there. Because of what's going on right now, when I grab a shopping cart, I stop by the sanitizing station to wipe down the cart before I begin shopping. The sanitizing station is just inside the entrance doors of the grocery store. As I'm finishing up wiping down my shopping cart, another shopper walks in, a man with a baseball cap on. The man sees me cleaning a shopping cart, walks up to me and says, Oh great, thanks and tries to grab the front of the cart and walk away. Not understanding yet that he thought I worked there, I think he's trying to steal it from me and had a vice grip on the back of the cart, which causes him to stumble. He whips his head back around and goes, What do you? Before cutting off mid-sentence and actually looking at me, in my ripped skinny jeans and my tiger varsity jacket, and my judging eyes. He then quietly says, Oh, you don't work here, before immediately turning around and walking away into the grocery store without a cart of his own. As I watched him walk away, finally realizing that he thought I was cleaning the cart for him, I see him pulling his baseball hat low down on his head in shame. He then stood in the distance by a soda display, hat low, and turns to face the shopping cart section, no doubt waiting for me to leave the area. I chuckled as I walked away to do my shopping, and when I was finally a safe distance away, I did catch him out of the corner of my eye, slowly approach the carts again, shake his head slightly, and grab one. It's alright man, we all make mistakes. I work here, but not for you. 
So I've worked for Company 2 for about 3 years, and our main job is putting down fancy looking stone blocks for high-end commercial buildings. About 2 years ago, they moved me over to one of the local multi-million pound house because they needed more manpower. The job was taken on by Company 1, and Company 2 was brought on as a contractor for the outer block work and tiles. Most of the work was finished when I started on that site but the buyer was meticulous with pointing out problems, so most of the jobs we did were replacing old damaged stuff. The tolerance for all the block work was 1mm, as per the contract that Company 1 signed. For anyone not familiar with construction, this is an insane tolerance to work around, and led to some hilarious stories, which maybe we'll talk about if people are interested. A little more context. Since this is a private building, and technically a finished house, we didn't have hard hats, steel boots, or jackets on so nothing to really identify ourselves. We basically know everyone on site by name. A two years down the line, and I'm one of two people from Company 2 on the site. Enter the big wigs. One of the main reasons why this job was going so wrong was the fact they had management for management's management. Stuff got so disconnected that the site management didn't even come down to look at what was going on, and they didn't know us. The directors of Company 1 came down to look at the job with some upper managers, presumably see how much longer this job was going to take. I was doing some grouting for a tile that I had just replaced when the boomers walk in and demanded I go clean up a mess in the other room. I presume they thought I was a laborer since I'm young looking and I had a brush in my hand. They walk off before I get a chance to say anything. I ignore them and carry on with my work since it's not my job to clean up after anyone other than myself. 20 minutes later, I've moved on to a broken tile in the room they asked me to clean out when the boomers walk in on me. They straight look at me for 5 seconds, open mouth, while I move their equipment from one side of the room to the other. This is where the fun begins. We've got upper managers. We've got the director. We've got the supervisor. We've got the site manager and me. Director. What the heck are you doing? I asked you to go clean that crap up. Why the heck are you just moving it to the other side of the room? Are you being funny with me, kid? Do you even want a job? Me. I don't, director. No. You've done enough talking. I've seen how long your breaks are. Just move it out. Now! Me, raising my voice. Look, I don't work for your company. I work for company too. Look, I know you don't work for us, but can you just clean it out anyways? Me. No, that's not my job. I've heard enough. You're fired. By this point, Director is red face mad. Me. Um, you can't fire me. If you want someone else from Company 2, you'll have to call my boss. I can get you the number. Upper Manager. Oh, so now you're trying to be smart, are you? Get the heck off my site. I just pack my stuff and leave. I know he doesn't have the authority to kick me off site. Only the site manager can, and he wasn't even there on site. But it's not worth the hassle. All the while, Director is berating me on how I'm a terrible laborer. I'm packing up my tools and he stops me from leaving, accusing me of stealing stuff. But after I show him they've all got my name on them, he lets me leave. Somehow it didn't set off alarm bells that I have masonry tools. Would you believe they meet me down the path while I'm driving down to jeer at me and tell me how useless I am? Very professional. I drive down the road and park up to call my boss. I tell him the whole situation and how I've been kicked off site. He just laughs and tells me he'll be down in 10 minutes. I can take the day off. I get a phone call about 2 hours later telling me that it's been sorted out but not to go back yet. He told the management that if they want to kick one of his staff off site that they need to call him. He'll still be invoicing me out to their company but won't be sending me back until I get a letter of apology for the way they treated me. Two days later, I'm called into the main office to have a look at the letter that came in. It was a small victory, but it tasted sweet. He gave me a copy to keep and framed his own. I started work that day and got an apology from the site manager and supervisor who assured me this won't happen again. Rumors started circulating, but nobody really knew what happened until I came back to tell them and showed them the letter. We laughed about it for a few weeks. Karen snatches a burger right off my sister's plate. My aunt who we will call Karen, was visiting my grandparents a few years ago. At the time, my little sister, who was 12 at the time, was very sick and couldn't eat properly for months. Don't worry, thank God she's all good now. So the minute that my poor parents and her finally got out of the hospital, 
The first thing they did was visit Granny's house for some good home-cooked food. After all they had eaten was gross hospital food for so long, they stayed with little sister the whole time. My granny was amazing as always. She made a ton of burgers and tasty homemade food just for them. After so many months at the hospital without any decent sleep, they slept on chairs near my sister, and without any normal meal nor a good bath, they finally could eat at home. They were just about to start eating when she came in. Enter my aunt, Karen. Karen. What? Granny. I made them for everyone. Sit down and eat. Karen ignores Granny, pointing at my little sister's burger. What is that? Why didn't you give my son much meat like you give to that girl? My dad. There's a lot, Karen. Here, you want my piece? Karen, while looking menacingly at my dad, measured the two pieces of meat in her eyes and then comes to Granny. After all I give to you, after all I have done to you, she pointed at my little sister's burger and then her son's burger. You give my little prince less meat than them? When do they ever help you like me? You probably know she's entitled and lying by now. She gets money from the rest of the family to help Granny and Grandpa, and she's still taking things from their house in return. My mom and dad help Granny and Grandpa always and never ask for anything in return. Granny, just sit down and eat. There's a lot of food. You want me to give Grandson another piece? Karen, no. How dare you give this girl more meat than my son? After all I've done for you. At this point, she straight up grabbed my sister's burger and put it on her five-year-old son's plate. My granny got so mad she started screaming, while my dad and my little sister died out of laughter inside. We're pretty much used to Karen in the family. In the end, her poor five-year-old son, of course, couldn't finish both huge burgers. My granny gave my little sister another burger. My dad just laughed all the way home. So, in a way, Karen kind of cheered them up after being at the hospital for so long. Her being overly annoying because of a piece of meat that she proceeded to steal the rest of it after lunch, becoming a running gag in our family. Speaking of burgers, what's your favorite place to get burgers from? Please let us know. Five guys for the win, bruh. Outdoor recess really isn't that important to me. Background. I went to a Catholic school that had the traditional uniform, white shirt, plaid skirt. Our uniform rules were strict about everything, shoe color, sock color, jewelry, etc. And in those rules, we were not permitted to wear leggings, nor sweatpants. Yoga pants weren't a thing back then, but they'd have been out of the question too. So when winter rolled around, we were cold, like all the time. The school was a big old marble and limestone monstrosity, so it was drafty and chilly, and we were just cold. To this day, I'm still always cold when I shouldn't be, and I wonder if years of being too cold just set in somehow. Anyhow, on to the story. Guess what else is cold in winter? Outdoor recess. What evil jerk of a man thought it was a good idea to force us to play outside in the cold without protective layers is beyond me, but that was the school policy. The boys got pants and blazers, so they were always warm enough, though they might catch a chill. And yes, we could take our jackets, but imagine being outside in a winter coat and a knee-length skirt. The coat was only helping so much. While the boys played, we girls would huddle next to the sewer grates and storm drains in the area trying to stay warm by the steam. Or if a delivery truck was on campus, we'd lean against the engine to leach some of the heat. I don't know how the faculty could watch this and just not care, but they never did. Edit. We did have indoor recess, but only if there was precipitation. And I don't mean expected bad weather. I mean there had to be something actively falling from the sky when they flung the doors open. If it just finished snowing two inches before we went out, too bad. If it had started raining five minutes after it started, too bad. Then we got to fifth grade and they wanted to teach us responsibility. This meant not just grades affected when we missed homework, but punishments as well. I wasn't aware of the new rules until I missed my first homework assignment. I don't remember why I didn't do it, just that it was an honest mistake. Maybe I left the book I needed at school. Maybe I forgot we had an assignment. I don't know. But the first case was totally accidental. So I came to class and didn't have my homework assignment. The teacher tells me to see her after class. Okay. She tells me, per the class contract, I signed at the beginning of the year. Since I didn't do my assignment, I have to stay late and eat lunch when everyone else has already gone out to recess 
thereby missing recess. I was bummed, but oh well, that's what I got for messing up. But then I served my punishment, and it was great. Everyone was done eating, so there was no line in the cafeteria. The lunch ladies were just packing up and felt kind of bad for me, so a few of them asked if I wanted anything extra. I found a seat in the entirely empty cafeteria and realized it was nice to eat in silence instead of the cacophony of hundreds of other students. Still, lunch and recess were our only real chance to socialize all day, and I wanted to catch friends I didn't have any morning classes with, so I asked the teacher in charge of lunch detention if I could go outside, since technically the punishment was late lunch, not missing recess, per the rule book. She declined and said that the late lunch was a means to take away recess as a punishment, so I had to stay in the whole time. Okay, I get it. I'm the one who messed up. And that was that, or so I thought. I spent the next couple months being a diligent student and turning in my assignments, but then the weather began to turn cold. Our recess conversations began to tilt to the same topic they did every year. Who had found a new source for thicker tights than we had worn last year? We had gotten quite creative, and though we hated the look, most of us had a giant stash of cable knit tights. Think of a knit sweater for your legs. The problem with knitted wear is the holes though. So though we looked warm, we still froze. Then one day I missed another assignment and the same punishment ensued and I had an idea. If I just didn't do my homework anymore, I'd get lunch detention every day and I wouldn't have to go outside in the cold. I'm a genius. So I stopped doing my homework in my class with the nicest teacher. I'm not entirely stupid, but I was in fifth grade, so not smarter than the adults around me yet. After like three days, the teacher pulls me aside and says if I don't have my homework tomorrow, she's calling my mom. Crap. Next day I have my homework for that class, but I skip another. And that gives me an idea. The rules say that if I miss my homework in any class, I get lunch detention that day. Unless it's already after lunch, and then the detention applies to the next day. So I'm careful about which classes I skip the work in. I can stagger my missed assignments enough that the teachers will just think I'm flaky, but not doing this on purpose. So that's what I do. Some days I miss a morning assignment, so I get detention that lunch. Other days I'll miss both a morning and afternoon assignment, so that covers lunch that day and the next. Four classes in the morning, four afternoon classes. I could stagger and just randomize just enough. I kept this up for about a month or so when the teachers must have started comparing notes or the lunch detention crew began to wonder why I was always in trouble. I wasn't sure what flagged the system, but mom got called. Why isn't Voodoo Daughter doing her homework? Is something going on at home that we should know about? Is she under any stress we haven't been informed of? Is she struggling with any subjects? Remember, posh private school. They want to be seen as caring, just not about us freezing. So mom sits me down. Why aren't you doing your homework? And I explain to her about being cold, about how the punishment of a quiet, late, solitary lunch with a good book in the warm cafeteria is way better than a loud lunch followed by a cold recess that I never really got warm from for the rest of the day. I explained to her my system and that I was still getting good grades on my tests. I understood the subjects and I wasn't skipping things I needed to work on, but I didn't see how there was a downside. I was doing less work, but maintaining my grades. I got to stay warm. I, an introvert, got to eat in a quiet space for my meal and the school was unwilling to offer any alternatives. Gotta give mom credit. Not only did she admit that I made complete sense, she told me she was proud of me. They had created the system and the rules. I had disagreed with them, found a way to live within their system and get everything I wanted. Here I was, 10 years old, and I was navigating bureaucracy better than most adults. She called the school and insisted on an in-person meeting with my principal and my homeroom teacher. She basically laid it all out. Mom. My daughter says that she and her friends were reprimanded when they tried to wear leggings and sweatpants outside to recess. Is this correct? Principal stammers. I, uh, thought we were here to discuss homework issues. Mom, we'll get to that. Apparently, they get very cold during recess. Is that correct? Principal. Well, yes. Mom, so I just want to get this on record. My daughter was willing to sit in this cold building all day in your dress code and only violated it when she was outside in the freezing winter temperatures and you decided that her health wasn't as important as your dress code? Principal. Well, they're outside, you see. Anyone driving by can see the schoolyard and to have all of them out there wearing whatever. Mom. 
Like all their bright, colorful, puffy winter jackets they're already wearing on top? Principal, it's our policy to teach these ladies to look like ladies, to prepare them for adulthood. Mom, so you refuse to change your dress code policy so they can stay warm? Principal, yes, I'm sorry, that won't be changing. Mom, then my daughter won't be doing her homework. Shocked looks. She doesn't want to go outside, but if she does her homework and asks to stay in, you tell her no. When she goes outside, you won't let her wear warm clothes. So she stopped doing her homework because it's the only way she can find that you'll allow her to stay warm. I fully support her system. Mom then explained my system to them and how if they weren't willing to change the rules, I was going to continue to abide by their rules and there was nothing they could do about it. I wasn't failing any classes. I wasn't hurting anyone or disrupting other students. I was just enjoying something that was meant to be a deterrent and they had no idea how to handle it. She told them that she couldn't think of one good reason I should comply and do my homework. If it was getting me nothing but benefits and zero drawbacks, then what reason did I have to keep up with my homework? The principal was stunned. You mean that right here in my office, you're giving your daughter permission to not do her homework? My mom turned to me and said, if you keep your grades up and you let me review your system and I approve of how often you're missing each class, you have my blessing to skip homework. Just enough to stay indoors for recess. No abusing the system. It's a stupid rule and I'm proud of you for finding a solution. She looked back at the principal. Does that answer your question? The principal looked back, stunned, but said nothing, eventually nodding and letting us go. After all, what could they really do about it? That's kind of it for the main story. But there's more for those who like a good long read. I kept up my routine for another few days and that's when one of the lunch monitor teachers came over and told me if I could eat a little faster, she'd let me run out and play with the other kids. I thought that was odd but told her, no thanks, I actually prefer it in here to out there. She looked bummed but didn't say anything. Then like two minutes later, she chimed in again and I knew who had ratted me out. Well, you see hun, if you're in here on detention every day, I have to be in here with you to make sure you're not misbehaving, and that means I don't get to go outside with the other teachers and chat. Every day, one of us has to stay in here with you and miss out on the one time of day we all get to socialize. So I'll make you a deal. If you eat quick and hurry out there, you can still get a few minutes of recess and I can chat with the other teachers. Aha! So that's what got me pinched. Now I wasn't just annoyed, I was upset. They called my mom and got me a conference with the principal all so they could have their lunchtime gossip session. I looked her straight in the eyes and said, you can go and play with your friends when you change the dress code or the weather gets warmer. Just cold, emotionless. To this day I get shivers thinking about the way I delivered that line to her. She backed away and didn't bring it up again. When I told my genius mom about the incident that evening, she laughed and suggested I explain my system to the other girls I knew also hated being cold. I didn't understand the gleam in her eye at the time. I was only 10 after all, but I did tell my friends what was up as I had been keeping it a secret to stay out of trouble. But now that my mom and the school knew, why hide it from my friends? So I told all the girls I usually hung out with about why I kept missing homework and staying in for recess. Before I knew it, we had a small indoor recess group, all of us rotating through skipping homework just enough to keep us inside every day. This went on all winter until the weather warmed up and we were happy to go outside again. The next year, when things got cold again, I was pulled aside and asked if I thought an indoor recess option might suit some students, and that if we could keep the volume down, we were welcome to stay in the cafeteria after lunch while others went outside. Wow, you're still reading this? Okay, last bit. The second year was much the same, only we didn't have to skip homework. We were just allowed to stay inside if we wanted to. On warm days, no one did, but on cold days, all the girls would stay inside and the boys would be outside yay for blazers and pants. Normally we were separated, so the only time the boys got to see us was at recess. It wasn't long before they were complaining that the girls never came outside for recess, but they didn't always want to be inside. And it was stupid that the dress code even kept the girls who liked outdoor stuff inside because they'd rather be warm. By the time we reached seventh grade, they reworked the entire uniform. We had summer and winter uniforms. We could now wear pants and button down shirts in winter months and they even designed us school sweaters so we could stay warm. And that is the story of how my little 10 year old self changed the entire uniform code at a 100 years old private school. Entitled parent demands a free painting and flips out when I refuse. Okay, so for a little context, 
I am a high school student in my junior year, and I've won various awards for my oil paintings. Some of my works are displayed in local galleries as well, and I take commissions, which vary in price depending on the type of painting they want. Most of my patrons request biblical paintings, since I am best at painting in a Renaissance Baroque style, and I love to paint scenes with lots of movement. That being said, I also paint a lot of portraits of families, local politicians, etc. Basically, if you pay me, I will paint anything. This all happened before all the craziness started, and I was displaying some of my work at my school's art fair. Basically, the district rented a huge auditorium where various schools would display their best work, and then auction it off for charity. It was a fun event, and a surprising amount of people showed up. Now here is where it starts. I had about 5 or 6 paintings on display. Most of them were depictions of Greek myths slash stories, with a few exceptions being a painting of Jesus' crucifixion and a painting of my girlfriend as a goddess, which she is. I had some business cards that my dad had gotten for me, which had some of my info just in case people wanted to commission me, along with a pamphlet of my prices and such. In comes the entitled parent with her baby and a carrying thingy. I don't know what they're called. They look like baskets. I'm sure you've seen one before. I must say, the baby looked pretty new. Their face was all swollen and they looked pretty small. Why would she bring a newborn baby to a crowded area with lots of noise? I don't know. But hey, I'm not a baby expert. She grabbed a business card and examined it, then looked back at my paintings. Entitled parent. Hey, these are pretty good. Obviously nowhere near as good as the old masters, but a pretty close second, I guess. Though for a 16-year-old, they're pretty good. Me. Oh, thanks, I guess. I've been painting for a pretty long time, and I'm glad that people enjoy my stuff. I appreciate the compliment. Oh, I see you do commissions. How much for one of me and my baby? Me. Well, it depends what you want. What did you have in mind? Maybe us laying in a field or something. I don't know. Something cute. Me. Oh, I can do that. What size did you have in mind? Entitled Parent points to the Jesus painting, which was 16 by 20. So a standard medium-ish painting. Me. Okay, well, for two people, normally it would be about $200. But since your baby is not a grown adult, I can make it 125. What? That's ridiculous. Why are you charging so much for a painting anyways? Me. Well, usually a painting that size takes me about 20 hours at least, and the paint that I use is pretty expensive too not counting the canvas or paint mediums that can be pretty pricey too. I don't care about that stuff. Why can't you just do it for free, huh? I am a single mother and I really want this painting done. At this point, I am floored. She's asking for 20 plus hours of work for free when I have school on top of it? Me, sorry, I don't think I can do that for you. It's just not worth my time. I have school to balance as well. I am a single mother, and you are telling me to pay $100 for this trash? Do you have no heart? I have to work so hard to provide for my daughter. I can't believe that you could be so heartless. At this point, she's yelling at me pretty loudly. Her baby is surprisingly still sound asleep. The couple I was talking to earlier comes to my defense. The girl. If you work so hard, then you would understand that doing hours of work for no pay is not worth it. The guy. Yeah, if you worked 20 hours and then didn't get your paycheck, you'd be pretty angry, huh? Entitled parent. That isn't the same thing. She is a high school student. She doesn't need the money. She can spare a few hours for me. Me. What? No, I can't. I am not giving you a painting for free. End of story. Either pay for it or leave. She gets red in the face at this point. She is seething in anger. You little jerk. I can't believe how rude you are. You don't even care that I work so hard. Me. You're right, I don't. Now if you aren't going to commission me, then can you please leave? You're making a scene when I have been nothing but nice to you. Fine, I will leave. She then walked up to one of my paintings and took it off the wall. Her baby wakes up and starts to cry, probably from all the noise. She begins to shush her baby and speed walks towards the exit, but not before a man, who I assume is a teacher or something, grabs her arm and attempts to take the painting back. She puts the baby carrier on the floor and attempts to wrestle it out of the guy's hands. They fumble for a while, yelling at each other while struggling with the painting. I should probably note at this point that the painting didn't have a frame or any protective glass over it. I probably should have done that, but it was too late. She ripped the painting out of his hand and smashed it against the floor like a hard rock singer in his guitar. Wood went flying everywhere. People were screaming at her. I was crying because I don't know how to handle my emotions. 
She turned back to me, sweaty and red. See what happens when you are a rude little jerk? Bad things. I hope you've learned your lesson. At this point, I didn't respond. I'm on the floor crying near my painting that I had put so much work into. The wood had pierced the canvas and now there was a huge hole in the middle of the painting. Entitled Parent gets dragged out of the venue as various teachers and other students try to comfort me. Eventually, I calm down a little and the event goes on. I did get about five commissions, so I guess it wasn't all bad, but I'm still furious about what happened. I'm just glad that I never get to see her again. Am I the jerk for going to my mom's house after my fiancé brought his nieces to our special dinner? I, female 26, have been with my fiancé for two years. His family all have kids and they made it a habit to dump their kids at his apartment so he could watch them. It's worth noting that he works too, but his family obviously doesn't care. He said he's been doing it for five years and it hasn't changed once we got engaged. His brother brings his kids to my fiance's place five days a week and despite me saying no, his brother didn't stop. Then his female cousin brings her two kids over, she's divorced, and have my fiance watch them. The apartment is always a mess. We don't go out because of me having to take part in watching the kids. He won't even ask them for money. Last month, the kids broke a valuable item that cost me money and I had to get a replacement. And that's without mentioning my mental health. And this is the reason I'm seriously considering not having kids despite the fact that my fiancé loves them. Which is nice, but I'm seriously hating it. Seeing how exhausting this has become, I asked my fiancé if we could go out for a romantic dinner since the kids are around most of the day and we don't get to have quality time and talk about stuff. He agreed and told me he will meet me at the restaurant after he got off work. I got dressed and was hoping for some quiet time with a nice meal and enjoying the evening. My fiancé was 15 minutes late. I called him three times but then stopped, thinking he was driving and couldn't answer. After a while, I hear some noise, then I saw his three nieces, 9, 6, and 12, walking in with my fiancé. I was stunned. I could see his face already saying sorry. He set the kids at our table and said that his brother had an emergency and went to cover a shift. He works with law enforcement and his wife, a nurse, was covering a 12-hour shift, said that he couldn't say no to him because his parents' house would take more driving time. He apologized and said he would make it up for me, but it felt hopeless at this point. I was so mad, but I didn't want to say anything offensive in front of the kids. I so wanted to get up and just leave after he took the kids' orders and just kept talking to them all the time. The kids started getting louder and I had to tell them to quiet down every five minutes. I waited till they finished eating and I was so tired of having to babysit his nieces. The 12 year old was so rude and talked about my dress. I insisted on going to my mom's house so the kids can stay at his place. He threw a tantrum not wanting me to leave him alone, but I ignored him and left. He called saying that he had a terrible night having to watch the kids alone and that I shouldn't have left and is calling me ridiculous after I told him to fix this because I was going to stay for a few more days at my mom's house. Edit to mention that I had already made it clear to his brother that we will no longer be watching his kids, but he keeps bringing them over and completely ignoring and disrespecting my wishes. Basically, just expecting us to be okay with this like he's the only one who has commitments. Well, what would you do in this situation? Do you agree with OP or not? Please let us know. Sounds like she's getting a little more than she bargained for. I don't work here and counter turns creepy. This happened to me a few years ago, not too long after I moved to my current neighborhood. I was working two jobs and just got out of one of them. I was wearing a coat from my full-time job, a very bright blue fleece with the agency's logo embroidered on the left side, zipped up with khaki slacks and a bright pink polo shirt. Yeah, our uniforms were a hot mess. I went to the local grocery store that at the time, the uniform was a primary blue polo, black apron or smock. It happened to be a rare evening off for my second job, same grocery store company, different location, and I was picking up a few groceries for dinner and a celebratory snack for having the night off, aka ice cream. I was examining the SpaghettiOs, don't judge me, when this guy comes towards me. I gave that Midwestern polite half smile as I moved my cart with my big old purse sitting on top to the side and nodded for him to pass so I could examine the offerings of gourmet canned pasta. Again, don't judge me. Once I moved over, I turned toward the shelf, not looking at him. Him. Where's the taco stuff? Me, looking up in surprise. Um, I don't know. I think I saw an employee in the next aisle over him looking disgusted. Don't give me that. You know what you're doing. I know you stalk it here. Where's the taco stuff? Me. I really don't know. 
I don't him getting impatient and rolling his eyes. Look, I know you're not stupid. Where's the dang taco stuff? Me, I don't work here. Go ask an employee. I don't want to ask an employee. I'm asking you. Now, where's the taco stuff? Frantically, I look around. I saw people at either end of the aisle, and as soon as they saw a large six-foot man screaming at me, a smaller woman, they all noped out of there right quick. Fortunately, we were both in view of the aisle signs right above our head. I looked up, turned around, and pointed. Me. See? Taco, right there, on the sign, next aisle over. Now go away and stop bothering me. Him, grinning, body language immediately switching from imposing to sleazy. See? Now was that so hard? You should try to smile more. Did you know you're cute when you get angry? He looks me up and down. You know, if I weren't married, I'd see if I could take you out for dinner. Me, recoiling inside with disgust. He laughed as he went away to wherever he came from. I'm ashamed to say that I grabbed my gourmet pasta and practically ran to the registers. I didn't get to the other treats I had planned to pick up that evening. At that time, I didn't have a lot of confidence and my ex-husband was making sure of that. We were in the process of a divorce and he is a master at gaslighting, so this experience really threw me off. Had this happened a lot more recently, there are so many more things I could do, like point to signs, shout, make a scene, put him in his place, etc. I think this guy just saw me as an easy target and went for it, especially once he discovered his mistake. Am I the jerk for telling my wife to step up as a mother? So I, 33 male, had been married to my wife, 31 female, for 6 years. Two years ago, we adopted our two kids, girl who's 7 and boy who's 5, from Haiti. They were toddlers when we brought them home, so we had never really been through the newborn stage. Well, my wife and I decided to have a biological baby. She's currently 5 months old. Well, when she was born, my wife decided she needed to make up for all the lost time that she was pregnant and in doing so, kinda left all the childcare on me. My wife loves the baby and cuddles with her, but the second she starts crying, my wife hands her over to me. She knows how to change her, but she believes it isn't her job. It was never something we agreed upon like some weird deal where we agreed she would carry the baby for 9 months and I would raise it. We formula feed, which I prefer, but I can't leave her home alone with the baby. Basically, yesterday I had to take my 7 year old to a soccer game. I left my wife with the baby and she was just sleeping in her crib. My wife called me mid game and screamed at me about leaving the baby with her. She said that she needed to be changed and I had to come back home and clean it up. I asked if she knew how to do it. She used to be a full time nanny and she said yes but it's not her job. I drove back home, changed the baby and took her back to the soccer game. By the time I came back, there were only about 10 minutes left. One of the other moms told me that my daughter had been switched to center midfield and scored three times in a row and basically won for her team. I was so proud. When she was done, she asked why the baby was here and I said I had to go pick her up. Then she asked if I had seen her while she was center mid and I told her the truth. She was so upset and wouldn't talk to me. I of course didn't badmouth my wife to her. I offered to go get her ice cream but she wasn't in the mood. When we got back home, I heard her crying to my wife. I obviously don't mind her venting to my wife, but my wife was saying things like, Yeah, he shouldn't have done that. And, I'm so sorry he treated you like that. Even though I told her on the phone that I was going to miss part of the game if I came and picked the baby up. My wife and I got in an argument later. I told her that she actually has to care for the baby and she basically called me selfish and lazy. We go to a marriage counselor. We don't have many problems in our marriage, but we had to do it for the adoption and we ended up sticking with it as well as our own therapists. The marriage counselor has ruled out postpartum and she has suggested for my wife to do more with the baby, but she doesn't want to. Here's where I am definitely the jerk. She said, stop acting like you're my slave or something. I then snapped back, well you need to step up as a parent. I know I'm the jerk for saying that to her, but am I the jerk for genuinely thinking it? Edit 1. Her therapist is technically called a psychiatrist and I'm pretty sure they can make a diagnosis, but correct me if I'm wrong. Two. I meant we didn't have problems when we started counseling. Edit. I made it up to my daughter. I messaged all of the moms I knew and was able to find someone who got a video of her scoring. I showed her and she was happy. We're having a late celebration at McDonald's in case anyone cares. Edit 3. I put this in a comment but she was raised by a single father. It's not really my information to share why though. Edit 4. Sorry if I can't get to all your comments. I turned off my notifications for like 3 hours and my inbox currently says 156. 
Well, what would you do in this situation? Do you agree with OP or his wife? Please let us know. I told Karen my world doesn't revolve around her. I'm 29, female, and my husband's sister, who's 35, female, and I used to have a good relationship. She was always kind to me when I was young. Husband and I are high school sweethearts. Four years ago, everything changed between us. I suffered seven pregnancy losses, including two that were just off the mark for being considered stillbirths, but I still count them. After the last one, I shut down and did not recover easily. I was depressed and I isolated myself. She had a baby three weeks before my last pregnancy loss. Four days later, she was having a baby naming party and we were supposed to go, had planned to go, but after a loss, I just couldn't and neither could my husband. He sent on the word and was talking to his sister. She said she understood and sympathized with my husband, but the next time she saw me again, she was cold. And then she told me she was hurt I hadn't shown up and made her baby party about me and my loss. She said I should have been there to support her. My husband had a huge fight with her over this and they ended up estranged. Then I found out I was pregnant early this year. It was a huge, nerve-wracking surprise. We were a mix of emotions. We had given up trying, but my babies hung in there and they were born two weeks ago. I'm still in shock. I still can't believe it. I'm a mom to babies. After losing all of them before, after giving up hope of it happening with biological kids. She came over with a gift Monday while my husband was at work and she told me I didn't deserve a gift when I wasn't at her last baby party and made it all about me. She asked why her? Why her baby party? Why wasn't I thinking of her? She told me I was selfish and should have considered how she would feel and how she was grieving too but she needed to get on with it and I should have put her first that one time. I told her calmly that my world did not revolve around her and she should leave my home. I also told her I never asked for a gift. She was free to take it if she felt that way. My husband is upset at his sister again. His sister is saying I was a jerk to say it when I was already in the wrong. I don't think so, but maybe I should have just asked her to leave. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you agree with? OP or her sister-in-law? Please let us know. Her sister-in-law sounds like a real piece of work. Stiff me on my bonus? That's going to cost you. Many, many moons ago, 1999, I started work as a pub manager for a successful independent pub, decent salary, and even better profit-related bonus scheme. The owner had just bought an old bank with a large car park and an ideal location for a large gastro pub just on the outskirts of the town center. It was in the direct footpath between the train and bus stations and the main bar area, so its footfall would be excellent. Over the course of the next 12 months, I worked excessive hours running the one pub whilst helping him design and set up the new pub. It was fun and rewarding, both financially and emotionally. The design of the gastro pub was excellent. It was oriental themed with an open plan kitchen so the customers could see the chefs working and as the owner had an oriental girlfriend, all the chefs were from her extended family. This point is key to the revenge. We opened with a bang and the place was a roaring success far busier than we had dared to hope and the initial new opening buzz just never died. We just kept getting busier and busier and I was working 7 days, 80 plus hours a week between the two pubs. We had to employ a second manager to run the first pub and ship even more of her extended family over to work in the kitchen. By the end of the first year, my bonus was close to double my salary. In fairness to the owner, he worked more than I did and I got on really well with him. Then he did me over. He married his girlfriend and she and I had never really got on very well, but she left me to do my job whilst she mainly looked after the kitchen side of things. The owner bought a brand new top spec Porsche and the wife got a new top spec Merce. I bought myself a Suzuki motorbike. All was going well until it came to my yearly bonus time. I was expecting it to be a lot less than the last year, what with the additional manager and that we were no longer running so short staffed, but it was drastically worse. By my calculations, it was almost 15,000 pounds short. I just checked, that's about 25,000 pounds nowadays. I of course queried this with the owner. It turned out that the company had bought the Porsche and the Merce as company vehicles and that was above the line for my bonus calculation on the P&L. They had also messed up some major capital investment expenses into the repairs line, also above the profit line. I was not happy to say the least, but since we worked so well together, I thought he'd be open to sorting it out somehow, but his wife stepped in and even went as far as to say if they could have lowered my bonus even more than they would have as I wasn't worth it. My personal life was in tatters 
and I'd been thinking about moving on anyway. All the money in the world isn't worth it if you work so much you ruin relationships. So I handed in my notice on the spot. This suited the wife perfectly. She made me hand over my keys and said I'd get my pay in lieu of notice, owed holiday pay, etc. But I wasn't to ever set foot in either of their pubs ever again. I was barred for life. Cue the revenge. The problem with treating someone who knows the exact ins and outs of your business with such disregard is that they know all the ways you have been breaking the law. Those chefs you brought over to work but never bothered to get visas for because it's too much trouble and too expensive? Be a crying shame if someone called immigration to let them know. Those company vehicles that were never used for company business? Be a crying shame if someone called the tax office to let them know. The messing around with the P&L to reduce the pre-tax profit? Be a crying shame if someone called the tax office with the details of what to look for. Those cash in hand staff you employed so you didn't have to pay NICS? Be a crying shame if someone called the tax office to let them know. For good measure, I also rang the local EHO. I wasn't sure as I didn't deal with the kitchen, but I was pretty sure they were breaking some of the hygiene laws. I know for a fact COSHH was broken as it was always the cheapest cleaning chemicals she could find so we never had data sheets. The fallout was epic. It hit the local press and the pub was closed for almost four months. I have no idea how much they got fined, but it had to be far more than my bonus would have been. Have you ever had a boss that did you wrong? And if so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I just want to know if their food was any good. Crazy dog owner abandons her dog in a shop for hours. We shall call the subject of this story, Jerk. So this happened earlier this year, just before lockdown, which is lucky for Jerk, or they might have been charged with a crime. I work in a shop that sells hardware and doesn't have an issue with people bringing their dogs in. I personally love dogs and don't have one, so take every opportunity for a bit of a cuddle. So I'm on my own in the shop one day when Jerk comes in to discuss some work she had asked us to carry out for her. She's got her two dogs with her. One is a big lab, X, and the other is a small terrier of some sort. I coo over the dogs and we get to discussing her job requirements. Once that's done, we chat for a while about dogs and all is well. Whilst we're chatting, she spots something in the shop that she likes and wants to buy. I give her a price and she says she has no cash and needs to go home and get some. I don't live far, she says. Just then the phone rings, so I answer, and while I'm talking to the caller, she plonks the small dog on the counter and tells me that it's too tired to walk any further and asks if I can look after it while she goes to get the money. I grudgingly agree because A, I can't really argue while I'm still trying to talk to the other customer on the phone and B, she doesn't live far, remember these words. So off she goes. 15 minutes later, I'm now holding the little dog who, getting a little stressed at the disappearance of Jerk, keeps making a break for the door. Another 5 minutes go by and no sign of her, then another 10 and still nothing. So I poke my head out of the door to see if she's walking down the road. Nope, nothing. I wait and wait. An hour after she's left, it's approaching closing time. Here I am on a Friday afternoon with a virtual stranger's whimpering dog in my arms. I couldn't put it down because we're on a busy road and it made a beeline for the door as soon as I did. All through this, I had other customers come in and I had to perch the dog on the counter while I served them. One lady even had to hold the dog for me whilst I carried out her order. So I tried to call Jerk's phone. No answer. Leave a message. Another half hour goes by and nothing. I try the phone again and nothing. Finally, on the third try, she answers and I ask her when she's going to be back as she was just popping home to get some cash. Oh, sorry, she says. When I got home, I needed to help my elderly neighbor with some gardening. I'm on my way. Great, I think. Won't be long now. Just then, my boss arrives back from his works out on site and asks why the heck I'm holding a small dog and who the heck does it belong to. I explain the situation and he's calm but not particularly happy. He also tells me that Jerk actually lives about 45 minutes away. Fantastic. Eventually, five minutes after closing time, just as I was making plans to take the dog home for the weekend, Jerk wanders in the door. Not a care in the world. No apology, nothing. I just want to get rid of her and get home so I'm polite but not friendly. I hand the dog over and try to hustle her out the door. My boss, on the other hand, does not like people who do things like this, so he tells her that he has given me a verbal warning because I agreed to look after the dog and it was her fault. He hadn't, but she didn't know that. She goes nuts. 
I mean like from calm and smiling to crazy in two seconds flat. She starts screeching about what a jerk he is. She rants and raves, flinging insults at us like a monkey throws things at the zoo, and eventually she storms out. My boss watches her, then calmly closes and locks the door. Ten seconds later, she's back because she just realized she left her phone inside. She slams into the glass door to throw it open, but it's locked, so she hits it hard. Then she steps back, hisses like a cat, and spits on the door handle, then leaves without the phone. I didn't even want to engage with her again, so I took the phone out to her at the bus stop. She tried to carry on the tirade, but I shut her down and went home. Speaking of dogs, do you have a dog? And if so, what kind? Please let us know. Teacup chihuahuas for the win. You want me to pour cold water to melt the ice? Background. When I was 16, while working as a bagger in a grocery store, we got a new manager. We will call her Elisa. Elisa had a very, I'm right, you're wrong attitude. She didn't care if she was in the wrong, but you better do what she told you until she changed her mind. If you spoke out against her, you would end up on her crap list and she would do her best to get you fired. Story. Generally, the bagger is the lowest position in a store. We collect carts from the lot, put away items, stock, clean, bag, and somehow we are always at fault. Cue Elisa. I had an early shift, clocked in, started morning duties, and I heard on the loudspeaker, OP, please come up to aisle six, frozen aisle seafood. Edit, this is a really big complex freezer. I came in and Elisa gives me a smile and asks me to grab a bucket and a scrub brush. We, I, was going to pull up the bottom aluminum floor panels at the bottom of the freezer and melt the ice that accumulates around the fans. It should take no longer than 30 minutes, she said. Make sure you use cold water since we don't want the temperature sensors to go off. Anything above 42 degrees Fahrenheit will set them off and corporate would call. I say, let me make sure I have this right. You would like me to fill the buckets with cold water and pour it on the ice in the freezer while the freezer is at 19 degrees Fahrenheit? Stares at me like I'm stupid. I inform her it isn't going to work. The water will freeze and just create a mound of ice. I suggest using hot or practically boiling water while watching the temperature. Elisa gives me a firm no and the threat of writing me up if I disobey. The start of malicious compliance begins. I've already figured that no matter what I do, I'm likely to be in trouble. To get the water, I had to fill in from the meat department sink. The meat manager asked what I was up to and I told the story with all the details. Meat manager is scratching his head and he heads over to call Elisa. She confirms and I hear a bit of arguing. Meat manager comes back, gives me a smile and says to do as I was told. He'd back me up. So for the next hour, I must have put about 200 gallons of cold water onto the freezer fan. I switched from a two gallon bucket to a five gallon bucket. I stopped and moved to the next fan each time the compartment was too brim with ice. I got four compartments done before she came to check on me. Instant rage. Elisa went from white to red real quick. How the heck could you mess something up so simple? Said Elisa. I said, I did exactly what you told me to. I took buckets of cold water and poured them on the ice around the fans. Right as she said she was going to write me up, the meat manager came over after hearing her. The meat manager saw the ice filled compartments and mentioned that I should have used hot water. This sent Elisa over the edge. Up to my office, now, you're being written up. The meat manager did what he said he'd do. He stuck up for me. Meat manager mentioned that he double checked with her what she wanted me to do and I was complying with her instructions. She went silent for a moment and it was like her head was going to pop off. She just took a deep breath and muttered out, fix it, and walked away. The meat manager gave me an extended industrial hose hooked up to the hot water. The water in the meat department gets up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit to kill bacteria. The ice was gone in 15 minutes and since apparently the freezer temperature measured as a whole, it never went above 34 degrees Fahrenheit. Elisa avoided me for over a week after that. I knew I was on her crap list and for the next eight months she tried to write me up for the most pitiful reasons. I eventually was given a written warning for leaving nine minutes early with approval from the front end manager that was friends with Elisa. At that point, I knew I would get fired for crap eventually and I quit without my two weeks. Am I the jerk for having a fake accent and not fixing it? Hello, this one is fairly short. English is my second language. I'm of Asian descent, but my family moved around a lot trying to figure out where they wanted to settle down. As a result, I grew up living in different countries, picking odd blocks of languages and with it some accents and speech patterns. My family are all spread over the world from Japan, Singapore, Germany, Ireland, 
you get the point. I sound very American, and according to my Discord friends, I even sound like a valley girl, and they're shocked when they find out I'm not. The other night, a new girl joined our server, and we were all chatting. I had just gotten off the phone with one of my cousins, who is currently in London. The thing is, when I speak to people from places I've lived in, I start to revive the accent. I'm not sure how to explain it, but my mom just says it's because I was exposed to it as a kid, and I slip in and out of it. Note that it's not even any real or formal accent, it's likely just what I was hearing as a kid. So I pop back in the channel and I go to tell someone to move to another lane. And the girl asks why I'm talking that way. I say, oops, I was speaking to my cousin in London and it slips. One of my real life friends explains to her that it happens when I talk to people from different countries and the girl said that that was a dumb thing to do because I'm mocking other cultures. She asked, Oh, so what's going to happen to your little accent if I talk like this? And she started saying things in what she introduced as her Chola accent. She challenged me to copy it, and I told her that she had it wrong. I explained to her that my friend didn't mean just any country. She meant countries I spent significant time in as I grew up. I told her sometimes I have an odd German accent, an odd British accent, an odd Filipino accent, and an odd Japanese accent. I say odd because you might be able to place it but it's just not quite right. She says that I'm manipulative for doing that and I should actively fix it since I can sound like I'm white. I told her, absolutely not. I just talk. I am not actively going to think about how it comes out. Anyway, the girl calls me an appropriating jerk and that I am a massive jerk for having fake accents, that I'm stealing from people's cultures and that I should just stick to my Pinoy accent if I want to seem interesting. Philippines is my birthplace, but most of my childhood was spent in Germany. Edit. I'm reading and responding to responses, but I just want to say I'm actually learning that this is a common thing and there's a name for it. Edit 2. I wasn't expecting this to blow up. I just wanted to address some things about it. I'm trying to read all comments and I saw someone bring up H-I-M-Y-M. -M. Legit, I went searching for the term from that and it was associative regression. But honestly, I think it's cool that it's called code switching too and I learned a lot looking it up. This girl is only a new girl on Discord but her and the IRL friend that stood up for me actually go to school together and have a mutual friend on the server, so those who suggested I link this post to her, I won't just be doing that. I'll also be trying to get her to read it right from my phone. I just need my friend with me because I'm so not a confrontational person. Oh, you want a man? Okay. I work in a field that is dominated by men. In fact, in my office of 30-ish people, only three of us are female. My direct boss, one of our QA reps, and myself. My job is a mix of technical support and customer service in a niche industry, and I've worked at my company for nearly 15 years doing the same job. Small company and not a lot of room to move as we tend to stick around. We deal with clients worldwide, and my department consists of six people. Generally, we have two to three on phones at any given time. One on chat, the other two working different queues. At least two to three times a week, I'm mistaken by clients as the secretary and asked to be transferred to tech support. My standard response is, I am part of tech support. What can I help you with today? And they are happy to work with me. Occasionally, maybe once every couple of years, someone will tell me that they want to talk to a male or more senior rep. My boss is fine with me accommodating those requests as long as we don't have a queue. On this particular day, we had me and our newest team member who had been with the company maybe a year at this point. He's now been with the company over five years. Two of our team members had the day off and it was later in the day, so the third phone person had finished their shift and gone home. It was busy and we had a bit of a queue and the new guy had a pretty difficult issue that he had been on the call for about 30 minutes. It was also when our management had their off-site, so we literally had no management in the office. I answer a call. Me. Thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Client. Can you transfer me to support? Me, I am in support. How can I help you today? Client, transfer me to a man. Women don't work in support. Me, I'm sorry, sir. All of our other representatives are on calls right now. How can I assist you today? The client hangs up. I take the next two calls, no issue. The third call is the same caller. Me, thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Can you transfer me to support? I am in support. The client hangs up before I can offer to assist him again. I take another two calls, all the meanwhile helping the new guy where I can as he's now about an hour on the call. Next call, yep, the same guy. Me, thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Can you transfer me to support? 
I am in support. How can I help you today? Transfer me to a man. Women don't work in support. Me. I'm sorry, sir. All our other representatives are on calls right now. Client. I'm not working with a woman. I want your manager. Me. I'm sorry. The manager is not in her office at this time. Client. No. I want a male manager. Me. I'm sorry. All the managers are away from their desks in a meeting at this time. I can request that one call you back when they're available. The client hangs up. At this point, the queue is clear and I continue to help the new guy with his issues. Five minutes later, I get a call. It's the same guy. Me. Thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Can you transfer me to support? I am in support. How can I help you today? He hangs up. Immediately, he calls back and I answer again. We have caller ID, so I can see it's the same guy. Me. Thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? He hangs up. This repeats about six times before I think he finally gave up. The new guy and I are close to fixing his client's issue. Maybe 10 minutes have passed since the guy stopped calling. When he calls back. Thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Client. Is there a mail available yet? The new guy fixes the issue and hangs up. Offers to take the call. Me. Yes. One moment while I transfer you to the other rep. Client. Finally. I transfer the call and the new guy answers. The client's issue is rather difficult and after about 5 minutes he asks for a more senior rep as the new guy doesn't know what he's doing. Client's words, not mine. The new guy looks at me and mouths, he wants a senior rep. To which I nod and he transfers the call back to me. Me. Thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Client. I asked for a senior rep, not you. Me. Sir, I am the senior rep available right now. I've been working with the company for over 10 years. Obviously, I know what I'm doing or I wouldn't still work here. The client reluctantly allows me to assist him and it took less than 15 minutes to get him going again as it was an issue we knew about with the version released when it started and as the new guy never dealt with the older versions, he was still learning the legacy protocols. To the client's credit, they have never asked me to talk to a male again and more often than not asked to talk to the female in support when they call. You should be ashamed. Irate customer blames me over the phone for another store's mistake. I had been meaning to share this little story on here after I honestly never thought I would have my own little experience of mistaken identity, but here we are. Back in March, I started to work at a local grocery store's online orders department, helping fulfill customers' curbside orders so they can be ready for pickup. From what my manager and supervisor have said, before the craziness started, the department was rather quiet with only a team of three to four really needed for things to run smoothly. However, it all quickly changed and now we need a team of 6-7 to seven every day just to barely function most of the time. This is due to the naturally massive influx of orders we've been getting and all of a sudden as many people now make the switch to online ordering due to the current times. Due to this sudden increased demand though, virtually every online order department hasn't been able to keep up half the time so orders being late have become quite common. This can naturally leave customers rather frustrated as they expect to have their groceries ready only to be informed that they're late. From my experience, most can be quite understanding, but occasionally you get those angry people who want an ear to be rate. Just to give you a little context, there are two major parts to my job. Part 1. Picking an order, going around the store to retrieve the items a customer ordered before dropping them off in our department. And Part 2. Taking an order, assembling the order for when a customer arrives to retrieve their groceries before taking it out to whichever designated parking spot they're in. For the past several months, Part 2 is what I've been doing as it's oftentimes the least enjoyed part of the job and has the most customer interaction. Now, I work in store A and during the week this call happened, things had been rather quiet. We didn't get as many orders as we usually do and we were able to do quite well for the past several days. To help speed things along, I was in the middle of picking a smaller order so my team could focus on the bigger ones when the mobile phone rang. Nothing new usually, just a customer calling to pick up their order. Today wasn't one of those days. Hello, thank you for calling Store A's curbside pickup. My name is OP. Are you here to pick up an order? You know, you guys should be awfully ashamed of yourself for how you do this online order stuff. Excuse me? What? The other day I came to your store to pick up my order. It was supposed to be ready at 1 p.m. However, I go to the store and I'm told my order isn't ready yet. My order was supposed to be ready, but it wasn't. I'm sorry, sir, but I think you called the wrong store. Uh, which store did this happen at? The man completely ignores what I had to say and just continues to ramble. Now I wasn't too happy about that, so I went inside to the customer service to complain about this because this is absolutely ridiculous. 
I placed in my order for 1 p.m., only for you guys to tell me that it wasn't ready. How? Me. Sir, I think you might have called the wrong store. We didn't have any late orders yesterday. So after complaining at customer service, some more people come on to complain about their orders being late too. As we're complaining, I see barely any employees wearing a mask, despite of what's going on right now. Do you want this whole thing to last longer? Do you want to spread it to even more people? People like you are why so many people are sick right now. The phone rings again. An actual customer is here to pick up their order, but my manager sees I'm still tied up with this guy, so he takes the call. I filmed the whole thing. How no employees were wearing masks when this one loud manager lady comes down to tell me to be quiet. That I'm being too loud when her voice is practically rattling the windows. She wasn't even wearing one either. Idiots like you are why this is going on for so long. I already posted the footage to Twitter and many are angry like me. You're going to get a call from the police and the court soon because of it. The guy hung up immediately after that. I'm still beyond confused, but the guy listened to absolutely nothing I said and just kept rambling on about something that happened at another store. Things go normal as I inform my manager about the irate customer just in case he calls the store directly. I'm making my way back to take out orders only for the guy to call again. I give my usual script only to be cut off. I came yesterday to pick up my order scheduled for 1 p.m., but you, store B people, told me it wasn't ready. It all made sense now. He thought he was yelling into the ear of someone from store B, not realizing he had called my store, store A. I'm sorry, sir, but this isn't store B. You called the wrong number. After going inside to complain, absolutely nobody was wearing any sort of masks. Do you people just want this to last forever? As this guy rambles, I see more people have shown up to retrieve their orders, and this guy just won't stop and listen at all. Not even offering to pass the phone to my manager will make him stop, as he's essentially now repeating everything he said before almost word for word. My supervisor finally just mimes for me to pass the phone to my manager so he can deal with this guy while I get back to my job. My manager has nearly a decade of retail experience with several years in HR, so he knows how to handle these kind of people. For the next 30 minutes, he was on the phone with this guy, listening to him complain endlessly into his ear and talking like a broken record at points as he repeats multiple points over and over again. All the while, my manager simply says, okay, each and every single time. I had been informed that after 30 minutes, my manager was finally able to get the guy to realize he had been calling the wrong store this whole time. He was complaining into the ears of people who had no clue what he was talking about. Apparently, he didn't even apologize, but did like how nice my manager was to him that he wanted to place his orders with us instead. After needing some help, he finally did with the whole thing, going rather smoothly, yet never showed up ever again. My guess was that the embarrassment of the whole situation finally caught up to him and he didn't want to come back. I'm probably wrong, but I can hope. Let it go? Okay, I will. Yesterday, me and my older brother went to a shopping mall where this incident took place. Cast, we've got me, we've got my big brother, and we've got the entitled girl. So we went to this place for some shopping. We don't usually go into this place, but since there were a few discounts on a few items we needed, big brother decided to check this place out. We went into the shop, and as soon as you step in, there's a greeter who welcomes you and asks if you need a trolley or a basket if we end up purchasing a lot of items. Big Brother said we need a trolley, so we took one and started getting to the aisle we needed to go to. I'm following Big Brother, and there's an old lady and two middle-aged ladies straight ahead. The old lady asked if she can borrow our trolley. No big deal. Big Brother passes our trolley to her and asks me to get another one when one of the two middle-aged ladies asks if they can have one too. Okay, no problem. I took two trolleys and gave one to the ladies. Big Brother and I were ready to go, but we saw a guy that he knew. So Big Brother gave me the list and told me to scout the area. He used to be in the military, so scouts first, and that he would catch up in a minute. I agreed and started looking for the items. And as soon as I thought I was getting close to the right aisle, Entitled Girl appears. She's probably in her 20s and has the attitude of a rich kid. She grabbed my trolley and started yanking on it. I was caught off guard and pulled my trolley away from her. Here's our conversation. Me. Excuse me? Entitled Girl. Give me that one and bring one more. Me. What? Give me that trolley and bring me one more trolley. Me. Go get your own. This is my trolley. Entitled girl. Are you out of your mind? We have a problem. Give me that trolley and get me one more. She kept yanking on the trolley. By the way, I'm not a big guy. 5'11", about 155 pounds. She looks about 5'1 or 5'2", maybe 85 pounds. 
she's using all her weight and muscles to try and pull the trolley back. That was a good forearm exercise for me. At this point, I'm thinking, what in the world is she thinking? We're in a shopping mall and she's asking for two trolleys because she has a problem? What's the problem? Maybe somebody got hurt and she's trying to put them in the trolley so she can get them to the hospital. Me. Get your own. I'm not your servant. Entitled girl. Give me that. By this time, Big Brother is done talking with his friend and is coming toward me. He made a gesture that said, what's going on? And I gestured back, I don't know. But right there I got my answer. You work here. Get another trolley for me. Now I realized she thought I worked there. So I tightened my grip and said, I don't work here. She loosened her grip and I thought this might be the end of it, right? Nope. Until this, she's been pulling the trolley facing me. Now she turns around and uses all her strength to pull it while screaming, Let it go! This time, Big Brother has almost reached me. He gestured what looked like, just let it go. So I did. All the force she had been using made her fly forward and crash. A few shop employees rushed over to her. Big Brother looked surprised and said, What the heck, dude? I didn't notice it until I heard the crash. Big Brother, maybe we should take baskets. I nodded and left that place until I noticed what actually made that chaos. The employees were dressed in pretty similar clothes to what I was wearing, so it must have been confusing. But still, she should have asked if I could bring her the trolleys instead of yanking and screaming. I think what's been going on has made more people more aggressive because they've been living alone for months without socializing. Karen's stepmom doesn't let me speak and lies to get me in trouble. So my parents divorced when I was very little and my dad got remarried to another woman who turned out to be a Karen. She didn't start acting like one towards me until I was much older though, around 7 or 8. My dad eventually divorced her, but not until I was 12. It's a long story. Anyway, I have many stories about her. I will probably tell those some other time, but here is my first one. So first, I was 10 or 11 at the time, and I was very socially awkward. Anyway, it was a Sunday night, and I was putting my clothes away in my closet like a good kid I was trying to be. Eventually, I finished up and went inside the other room to watch TV. A few minutes later, Karen comes in upset and tells me to come back to my room. I follow her into my open closet. This is how the conversation follows. Karen, want to tell me why you put your clothes up wrong? Me, confused and nervous as heck. Wh what do you mean? Karen grabs a shirt off the hanger. You put your shirts on wrong, and now you have stretched it. In truth, I don't really care how the shirt looks as long as the message on the shirt is okay and it's not like ripped in half or anything. I only care if it fits. Me. I look at it confused as to what I should be looking for. I don't see anything wrong with it. Karen. Figuring out this was going nowhere. How did you put this shirt on the hanger? I show her. I put it in through the top because it was easier than to go through the bottom because they would get more wrinkled that way. And then she would yell at me for that. Karen. Condescendingly. You are doing it wrong. Me. Well, can I explain why I did it that way? Karen, getting louder and more demeaning. Don't you dare argue with me. Me, I am not arguing. I just want to explain myself. Karen, same thing. Stop arguing back and listen to me, OP. Me, once again, do you want to know why I did it that way? This goes on for about 15 to 20 minutes with her just yelling in my face about how I am arguing back to her for showing me how to put my clothes up. Nothing but just non-stop shouting and her constantly cutting me off, saying I'm arguing and not being respectful. Finally, I just decide to be quiet and let her speak since this whole thing was going nowhere. She shows me the way I am supposed to put my clothes up and I am trying my best not to cry. She finally finished. She said something else. I forgot what exactly, but it was something I had been trying to say before the whole debacle occurred. Me. Okay, can I just say this one thing? This is where Karen cranked the crazy level up to a 10. That is it. We are going to talk to your father. She dragged me downstairs to the exact other side of the house where my dad was doing work on the computer. I was bawling my eyes out. All that flooded my head was, I am done for. I am done for. We enter the office and I sit in a chair in the corner and I'm crying like crazy saying, I'm done for. I legit felt like my dad would believe her over me because she is the adult. She tells him her side and blatantly lies to him, saying I was arguing back and wouldn't let her teach me. She said that no matter what, I wouldn't let her talk and I was being disrespectful the whole time, when really it was the other way around. So my dad pulled me aside with her in the office there looking at me. 
Finally, I get a chance to speak my mind. I told him what happened and why I did what I did. I also told him that I was trying to explain myself, but she would not let me speak and made up the whole arguing back stuff. She said that it was a lie and I know it. Luckily, my dad believed me and I got away without repercussions. For what I could tell, nothing happened to her, but she and my dad had been fighting for a while and eventually my dad divorced her. So I think that counts as a win. That is the first of the stories of my Karen. Have you ever had someone argue with you and not even give you a chance to speak? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Every time I talk to a manager. Am I the jerk for not letting my nephew keep the switch my husband gave him? I'm 24, female, and my husband, who's male, 26, tends to perceive small talks and questions as requests. I don't really know how to explain it, but you have to be very specific with the things you ask him for slash to do. For example, if you say that you like his phone and that you plan to get the same one, he's going to gift it to you immediately because he truly believes that's how the world works. It's confusing, but that's how his parents used to communicate with him and that's how he learned to respond. We are improving a lot and I know he has the biggest heart, but sadly, this has led to people taking advantage of him and taking his things away because he has a hard time saying no. Also, he just doesn't comprehend it first, but if you try to explain to him, he would, eventually, understand that you just want to talk and not ask him for anything. However, my family thinks that this is perfect, especially my sister and my brother-in-law, since my husband comes from a well-off family. They feel entitled to ask him for any luxury they want to have. An elegant dinner in a fancy restaurant with all paid? Ask OP's husband. Any material thing they want to have? Ask OP's husband. Thanks to that, I had to block them on my husband's phone to make sure they can only talk to him in my presence, meaning that I can control the things they ask for and just say no. They think that I'm the jerk because I'm enjoying all his money and that I'm selfish because we're a family and we should share it all. I just ignore them because I'm not wasting his money and I'm always trying to help him. I know that he loves my family and if it were for him, he would give them the world. But it's not fair, he isn't an ATM. Yesterday, my sister, who's 31, and brother-in-law, who's 38, and my nephew, who's 8, came to hang out with us, which seemed rare, but okay. I let it go, because my husband was so happy to see them, and he really adores our nephew. So while they all were playing, my sister expected me to be their maid, because they deserve a day in my life. We ended up arguing over this, and my husband took out nephew away. They, again, called me a selfish jerk, and I ended up asking them to leave and called my nephew. When he came back into the room, he had my husband's switch, with everything he had in his hands. He said that my husband gave it to him, which again, I was confused, so I asked him if that was true, and he said that my nephew asked him if he could keep it, and that he said yes. I told my nephew that he couldn't keep it because that belonged to my husband, and reminded him of his uncle's condition, that maybe we could give him one for Christmas. My sister and brother-in-law started to argue that if he gave it to him, then he could keep it and tried to leave with it. I was honestly tired at this point and just took the switch back and told them to stop behaving like beggars in front of their kid. Edit. OMG, I didn't expect this to blow up as it did. It's late now, but I will try to answer some of you tomorrow. However, there's something I want to address. My husband's family are not bad people and his brother loves him with all his heart. Please stop acting as if trusting them is the biggest error of my life. Guys, it's not. They adore him. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you let your nephew keep the switch or not? Please let us know. I sure wouldn't be allowing those relatives to come over again. Angel Investor tells me how I should be running my business. We were a couple of months into our little cafe being open and we're still making a name for ourselves. We had handed out pamphlets encouraging other local businesses to give us a try in the weeks prior. The owner of a local gym came in and introduced himself. We'll call him Brock. Brock was a tall, muscular man with blonde hair, icy blue eyes that stared right into your soul. Think White Walker level. And he was perhaps in his early to mid 40s. He was surprised to see that we had vegan options and talked about how he and his family were vegan. My partner and I introduced ourselves too. He took a seat. I brought him his coffee and vegan protein ball with a smile and went about my usual cafe duties. About half an hour later, as I'm walking past his table, he calls me over. Brock, I have a question. Me, sure Brock, what can I do for you? Brock, what is your strategy? Me, in regards to? Your business. I'd like to know how you're planning on taking down your competition. 
I'm not kidding or even exaggerating. Those were his exact words. Me, we don't plan on taking anyone down. Brock, surely you do. You can't expect to have a successful business without a strategy to attract your competitors' customers. Note, we were in a suburb that was still developing its cafe culture, and we were pretty unique in what we offered, so this was hardly a concern. Me, I think there's room for everyone, but I guess our strategy has always been to be the best we can possibly be. Provide good service and try to cater to people like yourself who don't have many other options around here. Brock, that's not enough. You need word of mouth. You need good reviews. Note, I totally agree with this statement, but not with his overall message. Me, good service and good quality leads to good reviews. Brock snorts. No, you have to make people review you. Force them or they won't do it. I was about to respond and he cut me off by saying, I know people and some people I know own a restaurant. He dropped the name and said I'd probably heard of it. I hadn't. I helped them out. We won't get into that. But they made a point of telling every single customer to write a review. Every single one. Me. I'm sure that was beneficial, but I'd prefer to have people willingly write their own good reviews and not to put any kind of pressure on my customers. At this, Brock let out a cold, fake laugh and said, in the most condescending tone, that is not how business works, sweetheart. This really rubbed me the wrong way, but I smiled and calmly responded, well, that's how my business works, Brock. He left about an hour later and I didn't say anything else to him other than the usual, thank you for coming, as he left. A few weeks later, he turned up an hour after our closing time, stared right at the closed sign, and then proceeded to knock on the door and wave at me. Since he was a local business owner, I figured it might be a business issue he needed to discuss, so I opened the door. He immediately said, large soy cappuccino, thanks. I politely told him that our machine was off and had been cleaned so I couldn't make him a coffee. He then exclaimed, God, why close so early? Why not close at five instead? I explained that afternoons were quiet. We eventually cut our hours even shorter. He stormed off. I apologized to his back. Not long after, one of our other customers, who was lovely, let me know that he had been A, badmouthing us on a vegan Facebook page, and B, to his customers and staff. He said on the vegan page, 50% of people were like, well, why would you ask for coffee when they were closed? And the other 50% were outraged and said we should have made the effort. Apparently though, in his post, he had written that he had done a lot for us and that we were therefore ungrateful when we didn't make him a coffee. This confused the heck out of me. He had bought one coffee, one protein ball, and then given me some unsolicited mansplaining about how I should run my business in a more ruthless manner. That was the extent of our interaction with him. Yet, this entitled jerk was telling people he had helped us? Out of curiosity, I looked him up. He had a website promoting himself as a self-made millionaire and an angel investor who was passionate about helping others. I remember saying to my partner that accepting his help would be somewhat like signing your soul over to the devil. This guy gave me the skeevies and I truly doubt he ever gave people money with no strings attached. Additionally, a couple of months later, our vegan baker, responsible for the brownies from my last post, who was truly a kind and gentle soul, brought him up. She asked if I knew him. He was very active in the local vegan community and so was our baker, so I didn't want to say anything negative about him. I silently nodded that yes, we had met him. She asked what he was like. At this point, she seemed uneasy, so I told her about the way he had treated us. She looked relieved and said he had approached her at a local market and said some weird condescending things but kept giving her a very fake smile and complimenting her at the same time. He had creeped her out and she felt like he wanted to use her or her business for his own gain. I wasn't at all shocked. Didn't see him much after that. His wife would come in occasionally and I was always polite, but careful. Have you ever met someone like Brock? And if so, what did they say to you? Please let us know. I think his real name must be Chad. Why aren't you smiling? One of my biggest pet peeves when working in retail was the countless times that customers got mad over situations that were out of the employee's control. Being out of a certain item, machines breaking, price changes, items being reshelved, everything that was left to the higher ups, not the overworked and underpaid staff. I've got many stories of people thinking I can magically make their favorite items be back in stock or that I could change the price of a certain item. Here's one story where the outcome was actually satisfying for a change. When I was 18, I used to work at a convenience store and one of our regulars was an elderly lady who bought the same bottle of off-brand frappuccino and smokes every single day. 
We'll call her CL for cranky lady. At first, she didn't seem all that bad, but she ended up being the type of person who wanted everything to be just so. Cranky lady wanted the exact same routine every single day. If we were out of her favorite cigs, out of her favorite coffee, or if she waited in line for more than five minutes, she'd share her displeasure with everyone unfortunate enough to listen. Ugh, I can't believe it. I haven't got all day, you know. Are you kidding me? Now this was back in my late teens, so I already had the self-esteem of roadkill. I wasn't too phased by people treating me like this. Plus, I knew I'd just get in more trouble if I retaliated, so I just learned to put up with her shenanigans. One day, Karen's routine was thrown way off course. By the time she entered our store, we were just restocking the SIG shelves. There were no more bottles of her favorite coffee, and there was a line of about five or six other customers. You could hear her usual exclamations of annoyance from across the store. I was running the register and got more nervous than usual when she approached the counter. Note, the quotes might not be exact as this was about five or six years ago. Karen, it's about dang time. Where's my Marlboro lights? Me, we're stocking the shelves as we speak, ma'am. It'll be a few minutes. Karen, I don't have a few minutes, jerk. I've been coming here every single day and I always get my iced frappuccino in Marlboro lights. Me, we have other kinds of Marlboro if you're interested. I don't want no other kinds. I always get my lights. Now, I wasn't diagnosed yet, but I developed CPTSD from being treated similarly by my father throughout my childhood. And something about the way Karen yelled at me gave me a similar feeling to when my dad was doing it. I tried to keep my best customer service demeanor, but it was hard to keep it up when you're also trying to bottle up your urge to get angry or start crying. Then Karen said something I don't think I've ever heard anyone complain to me about. Karen, why ain't you smiling? Me, ma'am, please calm down. Whatever happened to being bright and cheerful towards customers? Whatever happened to the customers always ride? Now, are you done getting my dang cigarettes? A couple of ladies in line criticized Karen for using language like this in front of her kids. Oh, shut up. This is America. I can say whatever the heck I want. Just when I felt like I was about to either explode in anger or in tears, my hero boss walked in and started escorting Karen out. She tried screaming, Get your hands off me. You respect your elders. I'm 78 years old. We didn't have any security, so my boss just guarded the door, letting other customers come in or out while keeping Karen out until she gave up and left. My boss apologized profusely and told me that the Karen was actually his grandmother-in-law. Apparently, everyone in their family thinks she has Asperger's syndrome, and a big part of it is obsession with routines. I kind of felt a little bad for her looking back on it, but also very much glad to have her gone. Later, my boss banned her from the store until she and I, quote, got her crap together. Cause judgment day coming hard and fast, whatever that means. Moral of the story, retail employees are people too. I don't work there, but I do work here. So I'm a security contractor, red guard, and I'm basically an on-call 24-7 officer with on-site shifts five days a week in charge of a shopping plaza of about 20 odd stores. I'm good at my job, but I'm very aware of where my authority ends, at the door of every business. I handle the plaza as a whole and am in charge of all the exterior of the building and parking lot areas. I will occasionally be asked to spook someone, keep a lookout, or back up a manager at a shop, but they are fully aware that if I did anything, it would be as a private citizen because while I'm in their store, I'm a customer. That being said, I do go into the shops to shop and for the most part, I'm talking with employees, joking around, grabbing food and getting out. If stopped and asked, I usually will lend a hand but again, I don't work there. Lastly, I only have three people who can override my authority on my post, my two direct bosses and the property manager. All three love me because again, I'm good at my job. We all have a, the truth shall set you free kind of understanding of how any complaints go and my word is above reproach in their eyes. I have stories about those complaints, rare as they are. Karen is a regular, but she doesn't bother me anymore. And here's her story. It starts off with me going into the grocery store on my post. As I'm walking down one of the aisles, an elderly lady stops me to ask if I could grab an item off the top shelf for her. No big deal, I'm 6'3", but I'm a friendly giant to her four foot and shrinking self. I obliged and moved on my merry way, and then I hear snapping behind me. I don't like that, ever. Karen is snapping her fingers at me and shouting down the aisle at me like a dog, but she might have a genuine complaint about something in my area 
so let me see what she wants. Nope, Karen, it's about time. I've been waiting here for 10 minutes. Now I can't find any of my brand of dog food. Go to the back and get me some. Me, I don't work here. I can't go in the back and do anything for you. Look for someone in a green polo. I'm in a gray and black security uniform, pretty standard. Karen, oh BS, you just helped her. You can help me. Me, even if I wanted to help you, which I don't, I'm not able to because I don't work here. I walk away as she's exploding at me, whatever. I pay for my items and go sit in my vehicle on my job site. Karen comes out onto my site, fuming about 15 minutes later. Learned after the fact that she had gone up to the grocery store manager and complained about me, to which he just shrugged and said he doesn't work for us, he's a customer. Karen stands by her vehicle and opens a whole bag of bread freshly bought and starts throwing it in clumps on the ground. I get out of my vehicle and approach Karen as she is now my problem. Me. Ma'am, I'm going to ask you to stop littering. Karen. Forget you, I'm feeding the ducks. Me. Okay, ma'am, I'm going to ask you to stop feeding the ducks and leave the property. Forget you, jerk. What are you going to do about it? You don't work here. Me. No, ma'am, I don't work for the shop. I work for the property that they rent from. The part you're standing on. The part you're currently littering on. The part that if you don't leave, I'll be forced to take the next legal action available to you. Now it's your choice. You can go or you can stay. But what happens next is on you. Karen continues her tirade. Me. Okay, your call. I call the locals. They show up and I tell them what's up. Karen goes nuclear level Karen. Gets told to leave or risk fines and trespassing etc etc. They don't want to deal with her either. I'm not pressing for anything just to have her gone. I'm leaning against my car just watching. Officer comes back from running her ID, instant handcuffs. Apparently someone skipped a court date and had a bench warrant. Oops, good job Karen. She gets hauled off the jail. And later that evening, her car gets towed for leaving it on the property overnight. Not me, another company. My final interaction with Karen happened a few days later. I'm on site, another day, another dollar. I spot three or four women huddled over something, so I go to investigate. A baby bird fell out of a nest. I offer to take care of it and scoop it up into my hand and it cuddles into my beard. Three soccer moms clap and coo cause it's kinda cute. Four looks me dead in the eyes and says, Ew, you're that jerk. Her cohorts turn to me and I smile and say, Yes ma'am, I certainly am. And walk away with my new bird friend. Karen has never bothered me again. If you blame it on the phone system one more time, I'm canceling our support contract. We had a customer in a very old hotel with very old hardware, phone system, etc. It was classy, clean, the building was well taken care of, but the owners didn't think technology needed to be upgraded. We installed software knowing their hardware was nearing the end of its life. The owners knew this too, but they just wanted us to make it happen. Everything ran poorly of course and was very unreliable. One constant problem was that the phone system would stop sending call data to be imported and charged to the guests. The problem was simple, the phone system just needed a reboot. Every time we told them this, the general manager would rant and tell us how crappy our service is, what a waste of money it is and that we obviously aren't looking into the problem because we always tell them the same thing. Also, rebooting the ancient Hitachi phone system always fixed the problem. So one day, after the GM goes on a particularly nasty rant with one of our technicians, she fires off a long and detailed email with an accounting of every time we told her that the problem was the phone system and refused to help her. She sends it to management, the CEO, and the owners of her own company. In the conclusion of her email, she states that if we ever again tell her that the phone system is the reason for the issue with the phone system, she will cancel the support contract and look for another software vendor. Within a couple of weeks, we get another call from her about the phone system not exporting call data. Before we respond with the solution, I remind everyone that she has demanded that we not tell her it's the phone system, so we comply. Every time she calls about this issue, we give her a canned response stating that we are unable to detect any problems on our side and that she should contact a local IT professional to diagnose the problem. This goes on for months until we get an angry email from one of the hotel owners. This was before everyone had a cell phone and they're likely missing out on thousands of dollars a month in phone revenue. The owner is furious with us and demands that we offer solutions immediately or he'll seek legal advice. I decide I'll respond. I apologize for the trouble he's experiencing and let him know that we're eager to help him 
but have been forbidden to mention the cause of the issue by the general manager. I attached the previous nasty email from her, which he also got, but probably didn't bother to read, and a copy of every support ticket related to this issue, with the final note always being, customer states that rebooting the phone system has resolved the issue. Dozens of these tickets were included. The next day, the owner responds with a pretty sincere apology. Among other things, he says he tried rebooting the phone system and it worked, and that he'll speak with the general manager about it. We never heard from that general manager again. I have no idea if she got fired, but she cost them thousands of dollars. Am I the jerk for telling a classmate to stop correcting me in front of the lecturer? I was born in Ireland and lived there until I was 10 when we moved to England. I'm now 21. I've still mostly got my accent and I know a little Irish, though I've not had much cause to use it aside from holidays back to Ireland to see my grandparents as the language is dying out. I'm in university on a literature course which has given me reason to discuss Irish-related subjects. I have this one classmate who corrects me on everything. He's corrected me on my pronunciation of Irish words, on my tellings of various myths, of various pieces of background knowledge, and it's gotten worse since we started talking about dissertations, as my topic is related to Ireland. I wouldn't mind if he was more informed than me or something, but he's just not, and the stuff he's correcting me on is ridiculous. There was one time I was talking about this myth, which has like 20 different variations within the story because it's a myth, and he interrupted me to say I was telling it wrong. Another time I pronounced a name, and he interrupted me to say, actually, it's pronounced, and then pronounced it wrong, because I am the Irish speaker here. He thinks he's right, because his granddad is Irish and taught him some stuff, but his granddad is from an entirely different part of Ireland to me, so of course there's going to be variations, and I've said to him in a friendly sort of way, that's probably the way you've heard it because it's subject to a lot of variation, but here's how I've heard it. But he's cut me off every time, saying that his is definitely the correct version, and that he had happily explained it to me, and then he said again that I'm wrong because his granddad said this is the real version. Then on Friday, we were on a Zoom call, me, him, and a few other students, and a lecturer who is overseeing our dissertations. I started talking about a myth I was going to include in my dissertation, and he goes, Actually, her wedding dress was blue, because that's the custom in Ireland. And I just said, no it wasn't, it was red. That's the point of this story, she was rebelling. I grew up with this story, please stop correcting me on things I know more about. It was awkward for a beat, and then I just finished telling the story. We moved on, the lecturer didn't bring it up, and the guy was silent for my whole section of the call. However, after the call, he messaged me in the group chat, the whole class shares, basically saying that that was a jerk thing to do in front of the lecturer, and when people asked what happened, he and the other people in the call related what I had said to him. He wants an apology, and the general consensus of the class group chat is that an apology is warranted. Even my friends in the class, who know about my past issues with this guy, feel that shutting him down in front of the lecturer and several peers was too far, and an apology is probably the best option here. Edit. To be clear, my friends and a couple of members of the group chat don't feel that shutting him down was the jerk move. It was shutting him down in front of the lecturer that they take issue with. Am I the jerk? Update. I just said something in class. He tried to correct me. Lecturer told him to shut up and let me speak. I'm no longer worried about being the jerk. Well, what do you think? Was it wrong for OP to call him out like that or not? Please let us know. I would have done a lot more than call him out. Would I be the jerk if I just up and left my family for a few days? I'm definitely the responsible party in my family. Significant other, one biological kid, three stepkids, three dogs, and two cats that manages this household as far as financially and keeping it presentable. A little more than two weeks ago, I had surgery that put me on my butt. I stayed in the bedroom or at the kitchen table all day every day and was never awake for more than three hours at a time. It's been rough, but I'm on the mend and now I can drive and stay awake for a reasonable amount of time and I'm not on meds anymore. So during my two weeks or so of being down, my house is now trashed. My family has destroyed it. It looks bad, it smells bad, and I'd be embarrassed to have company come calling. I scrubbed this house the night before surgery to the point you could eat off my floors, which is pretty much how I keep my home all the time. I don't feel like it's my job to come in after more than two weeks and clean up for my lazy, disrespectful family. So I'd like to get a hotel a couple of hours away, leave them a note telling them why I'm gone, when I'll return, and what I expect to be done before I come home. If it's not done, I would leave again, and I'd make that very clear in the letter. I'm also planning to tell them that I will use the Christmas savings money for every additional day I stay in a hotel. 
so the longer it takes them to get crap done, the less toys and such they'll get for Christmas. I feel incredibly disrespected. I'm ashamed of my home and my family for the way they have allowed it to get. I have spent every moment where I feel even a little bit capable of it trying to clean this house up enough that I'm not disgusted. I can't keep up and I shouldn't have had to try. I know it typically falls on me to clean and they've always had the expectation that mom will take care of everything but I've warned them that they have to start taking on some responsibilities. It's not fair to me that they get to go live it up and I just have to stay home and clean to feel comfortable in my own home. So would I be the jerk if I just took off for a few days and left it in their hands? Also, I cleaned up any mess that I made in the bedroom and at the table, as well as cleaned my bio kid's room, as she is on visit with her dad for a week. Everything else, I feel like it's their mess to clean. Want to add, they all left me alone for the weekend, with the pets, and went camping, assuming I'd clean the house while they're gone. They came straight home this morning and have been in bed since. Edit, I will wait for them to wake up and talk to them about everything first. As far as taking the Christmas gift money, I'm the sole earner in this house and I pay for them to go camping every single weekend since this craziness started and I rarely get to go because I'm home cleaning and taking care of the animals. Update. Stayed and talked, things went well. I'll be leaving tomorrow and they agree that they're the jerks. Not a fix for everything, but it's a start and I'll take it. So Karen, what did you think of today's stories? They were horrible. Horrible? How dare you? These were some of the best we've ever read. Oh, shut up, Mr. Reddit. It's ridiculous what people like myself have to go through. Dealing with stupid people like yourself and your subscribers. Look, Karen, you can say whatever you want about me, but don't you talk about my re-army. Tch, <laughs> re-army. Most of your viewers aren't even subscribed to your channel. 70% if I'm correct. Well, I can't argue with that. That's true, most... Most of my viewers don't actually subscribe for some reason. It's because you're stupid, Mr. Reddit. No, I'm not. All right, guys, let's prove Karen wrong by making sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn on notifications. Pah, they're not going to listen to you. And if you'd like me or Karen what? to record a special message for you, come visit me on Fiverr. Link pinned in the comments below. Never. And join as a channel member today and Karen will give you a special shout out in the next video. Like heck I will!